after lectures are over, that means closer to your final exam. <clears throat> but I would think that uh, it would be a good idea for you to pay attention to certain things, particularly, maybe you want to write this down, okay? Um, particularly pay attention to events unfolding uh, in Britain, okay, as a result of Brexit. Because what has happened is that <clears throat> uh, Britain had prior uh, previously uh, delayed implementation of a lot of the regulations and so on, uh, especially relating to customs, right, in the last year. So come uh, January this year, 2022, right, uh, all of the new regulations have therefore kicked in, right? So if you, if you just randomly, if you just randomly Google, if you just randomly Google Brexit uh, and EU, right, or Britain and EU, right, <coughs> you will notice that there are a fair number of articles that are highlighting the new customs uh, regulations that have recently kicked in and are actually placing a lot of burden on British businesses, right? So I have given you a link to one of the articles and I'm uh, you know, explaining you know, some of the effects to you. Right, towards the, <clears throat> the end of the lecture notes, right? But I need you to also pay attention to this because this one is technically unfolding as it is happening, right? So this is something that you need to pay attention to. Why you need to look at it, okay? I'll tell you that reason why. The, the angle, that means the angle of, of uh, inquiry, right? The rationale is not to say that, uh, you know, oh, um, you know, that British businesses are facing trouble because that would not, you know, really fit into the discussion that we have. What you want to, you know, uh, examine it from, right, is two things, okay? First thing, right, is the rationale that, you know, why did, um, why did the British, the referendum, right, basically vote for, you know, a yes to leave Britain, uh, leave Britain, to leave uh, EU, Right, that means the motivation behind Brexit, and they claim that you know they wanted to, uh, you know, reclaim sovereignty, and they wanted to make decisions for themselves. Uh, there was this rationale that there was a you know imposition of decisions right from Brussels, okay, and that had fueled um, in uh, it served as an inspiration, right? I wouldn't say fueled, uh, but it served as an inspiration for several other states to also chime similarly, all right, about how, you know, they would be interested in also, you know, exiting out from uh, uh, the EU, right? But the amount of troubles, right, that Britain has subsequently faced, right, and which I've mentioned to you, uh, you know, towards the end of the lecture, okay, why don't I just, you know, go to that slide, hold on, huh? hold on, let me just go to that slide, oh, I cannot even see this thing is so small. Now, I'm gonna close the I'm gonna close this and the chat. Okay. All right. <clears throat> uh, you know, uh this this kind of uh argument down here, right? Like uh as a result of the multiple zits and so on, right? Okay. So what you you want to highlight, okay, right, this one. Okay, what you want to highlight, right, when you look at you know the problem with the problems that uh Britain is facing as a result of that, they have got uh sluggish growth, right? Increased paperwork, okay. Uh, they have. They are now. The, the businesses are actually facing uh, a lot of red tape. They are now being slapped with additional customs duties. Some of the businesses have just said, "We give up, right? You know, maybe we might we might actually stop like, importing because it's expensive. The paperwork is complicated. Uh, it is difficult to get labor. There's a labor shortage that that you know as as a result of this. So." It serves as a reminder to some of the other states, right, who may have been considering, uh, you know, a, a zit, right, an exit from uh, EU, right, that, you know, this may not be entirely the best idea. Referendum, uh, not, I'm sorry, not referendum, a poll, right, recent poll in Britain also suggests that uh, there's a reversal of attitudes. Right? So then in, it suggests that, you know, people, right, in Britain are now seriously reconsidering, right, you know, the validity of their decision. Uh, you know, that when they voted yes to exit from uh, the EU. So that is like, it serves as a reminder to the rest of the states, right? Whether, you know, indeed exiting from uh, the EU is entirely, you know, such a great idea. Uh, is there an alternative, right? 
uh, are they able to strike deals, business deals, you know, external to the EU? Like, I think I was reading one article that highlighted there's only been one major deal that Britain has inked so far. I think, I think it's with Australia, if I'm not wrong, uh, that is outside of the EU, right? So it has not been, it has not proven, you know, to be an entirely uh, fruitful exercise, right? So you need to keep looking out for this, right? To look for examples that boost this particular argument or boost this particular case, right? Uh, you also have got, you know, resignations uh, in Britain of the Brexit ministers, right? I think already three of the ministers who were involved in the Brexit process have already uh, tended in their resignation. So that is one of the, you know, points that you want to uh Consider so that is why you need to con continue looking at you know uh, the logic of Brexit and, and keep an update on it. Right, uh, it is linked to the logic of Euroscepticism and so on. So that is one thing that I want y'all to uh, update on. The second thing that I need y'all to also uh, be cognizant of. Also, please write this down. Right, update uh, is the ongoing troubles right between uh, EU and Poland and Hungary. All right. Okay. All right. So, particularly, um, wait, uh, let me show you the slide also, right? I, I, I have summarized whatever I can for you at this point, right? Based on, you know, some of the ideas and I've given you links to the late, the, the, ah, yeah, 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 the newer videos and, and so on, right? Okay, all right, yeah, yeah. So, Poland and Hungary. Uh, Hungary, maybe not so much of, uh, you know, activity or update, right? They've made some statements recently, both Poland and Hungary are problem children when it comes to uh, EU, right? But in particular, Poland. All right, can you please write that down, right? Please pay attention. Look out for uh, EU versus Poland because uh, EU has just um, like mooted legal action against uh, Poland, right? Uh, not to say that they've mooted legal action against Poland to the point where they're going to kick Poland out of uh, EU, right? But uh, it could be a scenario where they are going to face daily fines from the EU, right? Uh, because neither of them want to back down, right? Uh, Poland has made some statements. It has made some judicial reforms and its actions domestically are totally at odds with EU sentiment, with EU values, with implementation of EU law, Right? So this is this has been actually ongoing for a couple of years already. I think uh, if I'm not wrong, it has been ongoing from end of twenty on end of twenty nineteen. I think uh, I, yeah, I think it's around from end of twenty nineteen, uh, around that period, uh, right? And um, you know, it, it, the the problem has only become bigger, right? So that is another update that I need you all to also look out for, right? Hungary is also another one. Uh, they, you know, they claim that uh, they want to reform. They, they, they claim that they do not want to exit out from the EU. They want to reform the EU instead. And these two problem children, right, they are related to the argument of, you know, uh, relating to supranationalism, right? Because their charge is that the EU is a supranational organization that, uh, you know, at, you know uh, supranationalism and neo-functionalism, right, the logic about integration, right, has occurred under the guise, according to these two countries, right, integration has occurred under the guise of overbearing, uh, you know, influence from Brussels. It has become a situation, according to Poland and Hungary, where the EU is overstepping boundaries, right, in terms of lawmaking, in terms of um, in terms of not recognizing the boundary between EU law, EU government, or, or, or e, no, sorry, EU parliamentary decisions, EU policy, and national competencies. So these two, the Brexit one, right? The so I would say the fallout or the aftermath of Brexit, which is the first point I mentioned, right? And the second one that I mentioned about Poland and Hungary, Poland in particular, right? These two would require you to pay attention to the developments that are upcoming, okay? 
All right, so these are the things that I want you to uh, look at, right? Because they are basically unfolding at the moment. The other one that uh, you want to also consider, right, which is, uh, you know, the, the recently, I mean, I don't, I, I'm not too sure whether there are going to be some more updates regarding that. There might be <clears throat> uh, regarding, uh, you know, uh, Russian action against uh, Ukraine. Right, Russian, uh, Russian intransigence, right, relating to Ukraine and Crimea. Uh, you know, EU has also made some statements. EU had, uh, you know, joint meeting with uh, uh, Ukraine with regards to this, right. So that is something also that maybe you want to take a look at, right. But in particular, you know, these are the updates, right. I have uh, linked, oh, no, sorry, I have uploaded for you two media articles last night, right. Uh, that I was reading, and I put it into e global. It's inside for you already, uh, relating, uh, I think, relating to the Brexit anniversary and relating to, um, I think, the Polish case. All right, so I've got two media articles there for you that is, uh, which I will run through verbally with you, or right, explain to you the, you know, the, the material. Uh, the rest of it, uh, please keep a lookout for it. As and when I find, you know, updates. I will include it into eGlobal. So, logic is this. After prelims, when I don't see y'all, uh, which will be, I think, late mid to late Feb, I think that's when the prelims usually are, right? So, after prelims, when I don't see y'all, that means when we finish all our regular classes, that means in between the period of the, <coughs> the prelims and the revision classes, and even after the revision, right, the local revisions, uh, do just keep a lookout. Maybe every, like, once a week or twice, maybe, okay, like twice a week, sorry, uh, once in two weeks, that's what I meant to say. Every once in two weeks, just log in into eGlobal uh, and see whether, you know, I've uploaded anything. Maybe I will do this. as If I upload a couple of things, then maybe, like, after I've uploaded maybe a couple of things, I will send you an email to say, please, you know, check out, uh, you know, the eGlobal to take a look at this, right? I know, you know, if when I upload things, y'all don't get an, an alert, right? You don't get, when I upload into content page in eGlobal, Wait, do you all get alert to say that lecture note has been uploaded? You do, is it? Oh, okay, okay. Then 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 no problem. Lah. Huh? Okay, can. All right. Also, that means you all would have gotten alert like middle of the morning, 4 o'clock. Or if you log in into eGlobal, then it will sh that there's uh, material uploaded and content page. Oh, okay, okay. Can. All right, yeah. So then then uh, then you just have to log in. Lah. Like maybe like maybe once in two weeks or what, just, just log in and check. Right, because these kinds of things, it's not in the con. Uh, sorry, it's not in the subject guide. Uh, but when, if, you know, depending on the question that they ask you, right? Um, so far, I've not really seen a question on the EU directly relating to Brexit. But <clears throat> because Brexit has already occurred uh, and it's already kicked in fully already, right? You know, in the in the past years, right? Uh, you know, it, you know, things were a little bit like. Uh, you know, when they trigger art Article 50, things may not have been actually, you know, set in, they were set in motion, but it had not, you know, cemented. <coughs> but, uh, you know, as of last year and this year, you know, things are more or less already cemented and, they're up in, and the developments are from, you know, the troubles that, that Britain is facing. So I would, is it recording? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm just talking this long, yeah, I check. <laughs> so uh, the rationale is that you could get a question asking about, you know, the impact of Brexit <clears throat> uh, on the EU, you could get a question uh, to ask you about how Brexit uh, may influence Euroscepticism or fuel Euroscepticism. You may get a question that asks you, uh, you know, how does Brexit technically, um, uh, you know, reiterate criticism of the EU, right? Basically saying that, uh, you know, that um, uh, the, the EU is a supranational organization and integration, you know, has taken on a nasty turn and so on. What is the future of EU and so on? So if you get questions like, what is the future of EU? Do you think the EU is going to fragment, right? Uh, do you think, you know, what are your opinions, right, on how subsequently, given developments in the last couple of years, right, with EU members, right, do you think, uh, you know, that EU may need to reform. Do you think that EU needs to recalibrate the way it approaches the logic of sovereignty, the way it approaches the logic of, you know, of engaging states, right? Or the very famous question that they like to ask you about EU, right? Whether, you know, um, you think that EU um, 
is an organization that basically requires states to give up their sovereignty. And even if you get that simple, straightforward question, right, that, you know, in order to become a member of the EU, states need to give up their sovereignty, right? Then you would still need to refer to these kinds of updates because this, this is basically what, you know, Poland and Hungary are basically arguing about. This is what Brexit was about as well. Right, so you would still need to, you know, um, look at these kinds of updates, right? Uh, I think the onus is on the student, right, uh, to actually be updated on this kind of information, and that will be the expectation of the marker. You can't just say like, oh, you know, it's not in the subject guide because IR political science, right? These are living, breathing subjects. That things that are changing all the time, right? So. While the core understanding, the core theory is like, what's the difference between neo-functionalism um, and supranationalism versus the idea of intergovernmentalism? That remains as it is, yes. But what are the illustrations or what are the iterations, right, that you would need to refer to? Or what, sorry, what are the manifestations, not the iterations, what are the manifestations of, you know, this logic of, you know, uh, neo-functionalism or supranationalism versus uh, um intergovernmentalism, right? So you would need to include these kinds of details, right? So there's no, I'm, I'm sorry, but there's no escaping, you know, the updating of it, right? So we will do what we can do, right? Of course, you know, that, I mean, if something happens today and then your exam is tomorrow and you don't include that update, you know, of course, you're not going to get penalized for it. And I don't think the marker is also going to penalize you for not including something that maybe has happened, you know, earlier this year. They're not going to penalize you I don't, I, I, I don't think, okay? I don't think they're going to penalise you for not mentioning like, oh, you know, um, like currently, right, uh, UK is facing these import issues and as a result of these new customs laws and so on. I don't think, they're not going to technically, I don't think they would technically penalise you for it. But I would think that if I was the marker and I see a student who has included this latest information and the latest information is relevant to the argument that they're making and relevant to the question, I would actually give you, you know, more credit for it. So rather than to think about like, oh, I didn't update the information, therefore I'm going to get penalized, right? I think that would only apply in a situation where you didn't update and therefore you have inaccurate facts, inaccurate details. That would be subject, I would say, to penalty, right? But I would say, the, I would look at it the other way around. The more updated my information is, and therefore the more relevant these examples are to the question and to the argument that you're formulating, the more credit you could, you could possibly get, which means you're looking at boosting your grade. You understand? So think of it in this way rather than think of it in a, in a, in a penalty logic. Right. Of course, you know, like uh, I'm sorry. I mean, as usual, I I forgot to adjust um, that one particular thing at the beginning of the lecture notes, which I've now adjusted already. Uh, I I indicated that you know it was 28 members. Right. Okay. I've adjusted it to 27. So please make the adjustment on on your set of notes as well. Right. I I, I missed that one out when I was uh, you know updating the slides. I mean, so if you're going to write like you know EU has got like 35 members. Or EU has got you know, uh, you know, twenty nine or, or you know that that kind of factual inaccuracy. Okay, that one would be subject to that penalty, I would say, right? But you know, otherwise, you know, think about the updating in terms of attempting to get more credit. But remember, please also write this down. I also want you to be cognizant of this, and this is a mistake that some students have made in the past for this course and for uh, you know the in, like intro to political science, right? Where there are updates, there is new information. And students are cognizant of this new information and they die die want to use this new information. But it is irrelevant to the question or it doesn't help. And it's like sticking out like a sore thumb, right, in the argument itself. That doesn't help you because that just distracts. I would think that that would be subject to penalty. Because when I you know when I read your your answers, right? Uh, you know, when and when I look at it, I'm like, hey, why why is this here? It doesn't make sense, is you know, uh, disrupts the flow, doesn't contribute to the argument at all. So you need to balance this logic of updating your information. Only use it where necessary. Use it where, okay, no, sorry. No, use it where relevant. That is the important point down here. Use it where relevant. I cannot emphasize this enough because there are so many people and, and, then, and then, you know, uh, there are students who like read things like, you know, from Nazi, Germany, and, you know, they go and read, you know, all these kinds of philosophical things and then they try to drag in material. They try to drag in some philosophical 
you know, thing from your political thought course and then, you know, you try to fit it in because you think it sounds good, right? Yeah, I mean, it shows that you understand the material, but it doesn't contribute to the argument. And I'm actually, I, I'm pointing this out because I'm actually seeing this crossover from some of the causes. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, you cannot include, you know, an argument by Hobbes or, you know, Morgenthau or somebody, somebody in a more advanced manner. But does it answer the question or not? Is it relevant, right? Does it disrupt the flow? Is it, uh, is it out of the syllabus to the point where it doesn't make sense anymore and it doesn't answer the question, right? I always go back to the same point about with answering the question, okay? All right, so these are the three things that I want to remind you all since, you know, we will soon be wrapping up, you know, the entire syllabus already. We're already at 16, all right? Next week, we do OAU, then after that, we do AU, then we do the two tribunals, International Criminal Court, and then it's, it's already conclusion, Right, so I've only got like a couple of topics more to you and I need to start reminding you about these kinds of things because we're getting closer and closer to the exam. I'm sorry to nag, right? But, uh, you know, I mean, yeah, that's what I'm here for. All right, okay? All right, okay. So that is what I uh, wanted to point out to you. I will not go through every single slide, right? Because, you know, some of it is just like info that is there for you to read. So I will explain, uh, you know, whatever I, you know, I, I need to explain. I want to pay attention a little bit uh, more to, you know, the, the updates part, right? Okay, so that is what I'm, you know, going to be emphasizing on a little bit, okay? All right, so that is, uh, you know, um, okay, the end of the, 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 you know, the reminders and everything. Okay, <clears throat> remember, uh, when you look, at, uh, this is a very big topic, all right? We spend a fair amount of time on it, right? So my recommendation to you is not to X it out, all right? Uh, at least, you know, have uh, adequate knowledge about this particular topic in terms of the two theories, right? The intergovernmentalism versus the neo-functionalism. Have knowledge of that. Have knowledge of, um, you know, the connection between, um, uh, you know, the logic of sovereignty, right, and the EU. Because you know, they could ask you a question, you know, on, on the logic of, you know, the importance of international organizations right and what are the effects of international organizations on state autonomy state sovereignty so that kind of open-ended question where you, know, you, you if you if you x out the eu topic right even if it is a question on, you know, on the on the on the basic fundamental logic of the state state right in state autonomy state sovereignty state power versus the logic of whether, you know, international organizations are significant in the international political system. It's actually this open-ended question, right? It is actually a question that asks you the role, it, it testing you on the role and function <clears throat> of international organizations in the international political system. But you would need to refer to the EU because that is actually the core example when it comes to discussing the logic of sovereignty and so on, correct? Right, so if, if you know if you get that question, which will be actually an easy question to answer, because you know information, you already know the details, right, and the theories and the concepts relating to sovereignty, <clears throat> relating to role function of international organizations. What are international organizations, right? The realist thought versus the social constructivist thought. Uh, you know about organizations, whether they're epiphenomenal according to Mia Shima and realism, or whether they are independent and autonomous, right? And that will still require you to refer to the EU. So how do you answer a question like that, which is, you know, like a gift question to you, because it tests you on the fundamentals. And there's a lot of things to write about, right? And if you don't have enough adequate knowledge on the EU, you understand what I mean, right? Yeah. So, you know, um, you know, sometimes I know when the topics are very big, sometimes it's a bit of a turnoff. Right, because it's like which part to look at. There's so many things to you know absorb. Right, so you know <clears throat> even when you are you know streamlining the topics that you are examining, right, look at the aspects of certain topics. That means don't X out the entire topic just because there's one part of it that you're not very comfortable with. Right, still look at the topic. Look at the rest of the parts. Like you know, I always tell students, right, you know maybe the technical aspects of you know like how IMF makes decisions and so on may be difficult to answer. But answering the, the question on, um, you know, the problems created by the structure adjustment... <coughs> Why are you like that? Answering questions related to the <coughs> problems associated with the structure adjustment programs, those are easy to answer, 
correct? So if you X out IMF and World Bank all together, then how, you know, you've just wasted one topic, right? Okay? Of course, my recommendation is not to X out any topics, lah, but that is my recommendation. You know, what you do with that recommendation, I cannot control, right? So, when you look at that, <coughs> critically assess, uh, discuss the effectiveness of the EU as an international actor. The word effectiveness, right, is subject to interpretation, right? So, you know, there are so many things that we discuss relating to effectiveness, relating to, you know, the logic of the function, the role <coughs> of EU, and so on. So, you know, look at that in a broader context, you know, look at what is it that we need to examine, and then, you know, proceed with your, um, with your, uh, what's that? <coughs> Your revision, okay? All right. Okay. Okay, so remember, <clears throat> these are some of the things that you need to be uh, off a, uh, you know, updated on, familiar with, right? The various treaties, okay? Uh, I've got a snapshot of, you know, some of the treaties for you, uh, which is like a summary of some of the treaties. Please do pay attention to the treaties, all right, uh, <clears throat> and when you look at the treaties, I want to point out this one. Maybe you want to write this down, okay? When you want to explain, uh, you know, the significance of the various treaties, what you want to highlight in particular, why are these important, right? What you want to explain, right, is um, you know, a couple of things. Number one, right, these treaties, the updating, there's so many different treaties, right? <clears throat> what is it related to? That means, what is the rationale? behind the organization coming up with these various treaties, the rationale behind it, institutionalization of particular organs of the EU, right? So some of these treaties empower, right, the European Parliament. It empowers, uh, you know, the logic of, uh, say, maybe having, you know, uh, strengths or strengthening, right, of certain controls relating to the currency, certain controls relating to customs, relating to law, relating to the particular organs within the EU, right? Uh, whether, you know, like say, for example, the Treaty of Nice, right? They were, and, you know, they were looking at and the Treaty of Lisbon. They were looking at the logic of having an EU foreign minister, right? What, what is the rationale behind that? Why, you know, did they want to have, uh, you know, a EU, EU foreign minister? Because they were interested in the logic of the ability of the EU to have diplomatic, EU as a bloc, to have diplomatic relations with other actors, external actors, right? And that is how they, you know, arrived at the External Action Service, right? The EEAS, right? So that's the rationale behind looking at, you know, why you have so many treaties, right? It has to do with addressing the institutionalization, the empowerment of particular organs within the EU itself, right? It has to do... And, and why do you need to institutionalize these organs? Why do you need to address... Uh, empowerment. Why do you need to make the organs more powerful? That comes down to the fundamental argument. Where, oh, sorry, not where, how many, how many members, right, did EU originally start off with? Right, the Benelux. Right? How many states does it now have? And how many are in the queue, right, wanting to be part of the organisation? Right, so remember we talked about the logic of enlargement. Right? The more members you take on, the more complex decision-making becomes, more complex negotiations become. If negotiations and decision-making become more complex, you need to have the requisite provisions, right? You need to have the requisite strengths within the organs to deal with these issues as well, correct? Right? So it is related to the enlargement of the organization as well. It's related to the reform, the update, the rejuvenation of the organization. Well, you know, we are very funny, right? We like to critique the organization. We like to criticize the organization. When they, do, when they remain as they are, we say, oh, they're static, right? They do not, you know, uh, you know they are um, archaic, right? They have not, you know, reformed. When they keep reforming and re keep rejuvenating, they say, oh, there are so many different treaties to pay attention to. There are so many different aspects to know to, you know, it's confusing, right? <clears throat> but the logic is that it is not an organization that is static either, right? And with all of these different changes occurring in the continent, with all of these different changes occurring as a result of problem children members, right? Please do not use the word problem child uh, in your exam. I, I'm just using it to explain, all right? Okay, uh, I, I know. Because I actually see some of these phrases sometimes, right? 
Okay. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, as a result of these kinds of troublesome, you know, member states, right? Uh, you would need to have an updating of all of these kinds of mechanisms within the organization itself, right? So that is why you, you know, examine the different treaties, examine what the treaties are for, what is it that they're targeting, why is it, uh, you know, that they're looking at certain things. Like, for example, in, in the subsequent, uh, you know, I think it's slide eight, right? I look at the EU fiscal compact, right? And there's a rationale. Why is it that they wanted to have fiscal compact, right? Yeah, uh, it is the the... I cannot remember what the treaty is called. Uh, the Trade and Something Something Treaty, Stability Treaty, right? TCSG or something. But if, uh, in other words, it's referred to as a fiscal compact. I'll run through that in a little bit. Right? Why do they need to have that? Why do they need to think about you know, the financial health of the member states? Right? Because of this enlargement, right? So that's the rationale behind you know, the different important treaties uh, that you, know, uh, you want to pay attention to in terms of how it strengthens the organization per se. Then you want to also, you know, make sure that your arguments refer to the Single European Act, Single Market Program. Why? Because these are the cornerstones of the development, right, and, uh, you know, of the EU per se, right? This is what a lot of, you know, the discussion on EU hinges on, right? <clears throat> what arises out of it? Your Schengen, all right, the Eurozone, the Euro per se, which just celebrated, you know, their 20th anniversary, I think, I think earlier was uh, earlier this week, if I'm not wrong, right? So that is, you know, something. Uh, these two are considered to be the cornerstone. So go back to lecture fifteen, right? Fourth, I mean, okay, sorry, fourteen and fifteen. Uh, both of them, you know, deal with this, right? But lecture fifteen talks more, a, a little bit more about the single European Act and the single market program. And of course, look at the eurozone, right? Whether you think it's healthy, uh, whether you think it has benefited states or not, right? Uh, and, and so on the stability. Right. When you look at Eurozone, you want to talk about the logic of stability. Okay. All right. So these are the things that you want to uh, pay attention to. Okay. All right. So I've got some, you know, uh, like, you know, summary ideas for you right here, uh, you know, to that you can use in like what I've written in the in the header. Right. Good for para intro paragraphs, good for, you know, your transition paragraphs or evaluations. Right. Just tweak it a little bit. Um, if you're having your physical exams, right, uh, did physical exam, they mentioned, they sent you an email, right, that it's physical exam. Did they mention that it's open book or closed book? But if it's physical, I think it actually might be closed book, right? Okay, I, I'm not too sure. I've not gotten any details on that either. Um, but, but, but in the event that it still remains as open book, even if it's physical, I, I do not know. Okay, let's just be fluid about this whole thing, huh? Okay, until we get extra uh, actual confirmation. Uh, what you do is like just tweak some of these statements a little bit, you know, like, you know, uh, use your own words a little bit. Just just tweak it a little bit so you avoid that whole problem about plagiarism because, you know, for the life of me, I, I'll be very honest, I cannot remember where I've cobbled all of these from. It's taken from a variety of sources, all right, from the, you know, from, you know, Armstrong, Redman and Lloyd. It's taken from things that I, you know, read uh, in articles or in Kant's means and stuff. So it's cobbled together. Right, so you know, just tweak some of the you know words, tweak some of the statements, right? You know, not not lost in translation, right? But just tweak some, tweak some of it a little bit, right? Okay, that's what I know. I want to uh, you know talk about. So you know, um, some of these statements, like for example, despite you know, uh, you know, the states being sovereign, independent states, right? They've pulled some of their sovereignty. So the that means you know the logic and concept of sovereignty is a bit more fluid, right? Not so much like you know how you would see as an organizing principle. Uh, in continents or international societies like Africa, like, you know, the African international society, how they view the logic of, uh, you know, sovereignty. Sovereignty is an organ. you know, I always mention this, right? So sovereignty is an organizing principle in uh, African international order, right? Because as, as a result of many years of colonization and then subsequently decolonization, crutch mentality that has developed as a result of, you know, support given by international actors uh, during the Cold War, and then subsequently support given by international organizations and so on, right? So sovereignty is a very, you know, strong organizing principle uh, in continents like Africa uh, or in uh, East Asia and the Pacific even, right? So the idea of sovereignty uh, as understood, you know, in EU is, you know, slightly different in the sense that they, <clears throat> states have, you know, delegated some of these decision-making powers to these institutions that they have created via consensus, I think that's very important. I think I, I, I very rarely see students talk about this point, you know, these shared institutions that 
states have created together as a result of consensus building within the EU. Right? You know, not enough students emphasize this point. The decisions at the end of the day are made via consensus. Right, in you know the European Parliament, and later on when we look at the MEPs also, right, where they are actually you know remain representatives of their national you know uh, uh, domestic governments, right. So this whole you know hullabaloo of you know how uh, yeah I, I like that word you know this hullabaloo of you know um, how uh, you know these the the, the the Brussels is overbearing and is, you know, dominating and, you know, overstepped its boundaries and all. It is an argument that, you know, is championed by particular states that maybe have a more hardline approach to, uh, you know, protecting their sovereignty and in protecting their domestic institutions and so on. Orban uh, from Hungary, right, you know, he's, you know, envisioned himself as a protector of Hungarian culture and, you know, political culture and, 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 you know, like a defender of Christian values and so on, right? And, and he uses this argument, right, you know, that uh, the EU has overstepped its boundaries and I'll explain that to you later, right? So you need to think about this, you know, when you when you make this argument about sovereignty. Can you please underline the argument, right, and, and make an indication that the first bullet point, uh, sorry, the second bullet point, right, about the sovereignty issue. Okay, so that's what you need to, you know, uh, think about, right? Okay, uh, and, you know, the rationale is that, uh, you know, they make, you know, decisions uh, on specific in matters of joint interest that made, that are made democratically at the European level. Can you uh, indicate here, right, write in your notes here, to make a cross-reference, okay, cross-reference. I've given you a link, right, at the end of the lecture notes, right, uh, in the section, in, I think the slide is called Moving Forward. It's right at the end of the lecture notes. Uh, we have given you a link to uh, what they call the Euro, the Euro barometer. It's like a poll, all right? Barometer. It's like a poll uh, where they measure the satisfaction and unhappiness or happiness, right, uh, of EU citizens and what they think about the EU, right? So, indeed, right? Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, before I, 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 go, uh, I go there. Uh, and the latest poll, right, the latest one, right, has revealed that uh, sentiment, public sentiment regarding the EU <coughs> is actually at one of its highest, right? That means there's a positive response to the EU. There's a positive response to EU activities, right? It is at literally its highest since, I think, 2008 and 2009. Right. Okay. So you make the connection there. If indeed, right, that uh, you know the EU is entirely overbearing. If indeed states have to have given up their sovereignty and no longer remain independent, right? Then why is it that public sentiment among EU citizens, right, uh, according to the EU barometer, the one of the newest, the latest, uh, you know, polls, right, indicates that you know sentiment is at an all-time high. Right, uh, you know, in comparison to uh, you know, uh, all time high vis a vis, I think the highest, which was I think 2008 2009. Correct. So that is the connection that you can make. So, you know, don't just my, my point down here, you know, and, and I know the arguments are getting more and more complicated because I'm asking you to connect, you know, A to Z and I'm asking you to connect, you know, X to Y. Right. I, I know I'm, I'm asking you to do that, but I'm pointing all of these things out because this is what uh, a marker would consider to be analytical discussion right rather than you just say uh yeah yeah you know um you know they have shared interests they have sh you know created these organizations uh you know via consensus yeah that is one part of it but if you can make the connection right to another argument that would actually up the analytical quotient of your answer and that is how you score right that is what you know how you say you know, I've written so much, how come my score is, you know, hovering at the 40-something and the 50-something? And how come somebody else is able to score 90-something or 80-something, which has happened before in this course, right? We've had people who scored like 82 and 83. I think this girl called Ruby, if I'm not wrong. And, and, and Jishan also another one, I think 81 or something along those lines. So, it, uh, and, and then you have people who unfortunately get like 38 and 39, right? Uh, it, it happens. Both happen, right? But the rationale is that how do these people who score very well, right? How do they actually get the that kind of score? It's because of these kinds of connections that they make, these kinds of ana analysis that they include, right? And that is the direction that you want to go towards, okay? So I know it gets complicated, but if you, as, as I'm explaining, right, and as you read the material, you make these small, small connections, right? And if you write it down, then when you, when you write it down, and wh why I always say write it down, right? 
maybe because it's my style of, of learning. Because when I write things down, I remember. When you write it down, you can actually physically see it. You know, and then it makes it less complicated to remember. So that's why I always say, oh, write it down, write it down. Okay? All right. Uh, it has seen a number of achievements. I don't like this, the, the, the third statement too much, you know, where they make this comparison, uh, you know, as a confederation of states and so on, right? I would still think that, you know, the, the EU is a representation of uh, regional slash international organizations that is unique in the sense, not, you know, not unique to the point where it's sui generis, right? That you cannot identify what it actually is, but unique in the sense that it is... Um, an attempt, right, to streamline decision making in, uh, you know, in uh, a continent that was previously extremely fragmented, right. So, you know, um, you know some authors, you, you would I put that in because you know you would see that, and I do not want you all to get you know confused and say like you know how come we didn't address this point. But you know, I I would rather think you know more of it as you know the second point, right, the loose intergovernmental cooperation system. I think that is a more accurate description right, of, uh, you know, the EU rather than to say that it's similar to the confederation of states or a federal system. I wouldn't think of it uh, so much as, you know, uh, 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 an example of federalism. You know, I, I really wouldn't uh, go in that direction. I would take the second point, right, the loose intergovernmental cooperation system, you know, uh, that, that it has come to represent, right? Uh, you know, okay, all right, take a look at the number of achievements. This one all, you can, you, you can use this last point. We're going to write it down. You can use that last point as a transitionary paragraph, right? A transition point when you talk about the achievements, right? That means you start off your argument <clears throat> by saying that, okay, right, uh, these are all the criticisms that are leveled against the EU, right? But that said, uh, it has actually contributed effectively to the European, the development of the European, uh, you know, uh, economy and the uh, European, sorry, the European bloc, Right, in terms of e the economy as well as diplomatic relations or political relations with other states. Right? And then in order to explain, to make that transition from the criticism or the negative aspects that you know, are being discussed of the EU to transit to an argument that says, okay, right, these are the positive aspects of EU, these are the contributions that it has made. We need to have that transitionary paragraph. Right? So you can use that you know, to say that, you know, that despite you know, criticisms, there have been several achievements since 1950. And you list some of these. Then you go on to explain, okay, in terms of <clears throat> trade, these are what I think you know, the positive aspects are. In terms of, uh, not, uh, in terms of dispute resolution, these are the positive aspects. In terms of enlargement and taking on members, right, from the Eastern European, uh, 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 you know, part of, uh, so the Eastern, from, from Eastern Europe, right, uh, which, you know, is a representation of, you know, uh, the sphere of influence of the EU, which is a representation of the identity, European identity, European values, the spread of democracy, all of these, you know, uh, you know arguments that you want to make. Then you can go on, you know, thematically, one by one. Right, but how do you make that transition? This is some. This is like some a problem that some students have expressed before. You know, how do I suddenly shift from you know criticism or negative aspect and then you know move on to the positive aspect? You need to have that transitionary paragraph. That one can be you know this this last bullet point can be uh, you know one of the ways to do so. Okay, then you've also got ah this one very important codification of law, right? Uh, which is exactly you know what you know uh Poland. And Hungary are actually arguing about, right, okay, uh, the logic of, you know, uh, Poland has actually, you know, made this issue where they have attempted uh, you know, on, the net, on, on their domestic level to actually say that, you know, they don't want to um, uh, implement EU law in particular areas, right. But that is what, you know, the, the logic behind EU is. Remember, when we first started off with this entire course and we watched this video about, you know, what are international organisations, what do we what do we make what what core argument do we make? International organizations are juridical in nature, juridical, based on law, right? There's a legal basis to it, right? And that's what you want to emphasize down here, right? So the EU is based on the your videos of page law, and YouTube studio right? shows all. Relate, can you please put a a bracket down here, right? Write it down. Relate this to the Polish problem, right? Because it this is exactly what the problem between Poland and EU represents, right? And if EU backs down and gives in to Poland and doesn't sanction it, 
doesn't censure it, then it calls into question, what does the EU actually represent? What does the EU actually believe in? Right? Because if the EU is based on the rule of law and you have a member state who is belligerently saying, I do not want to implement, I do not want to allow EU law to touch certain areas in my domestic policy because this oversteps the boundary, then it goes against right, what the EU actually represents. Right? So this point here is connected to the argument on Poland. Okay? Can you make the connection there as well? Okay? All right, so that means logic is this, right? Okay, if you are writing an, uh, in your exam answer, right, the updating, uh, you know, the, update, the updates on Poland, right, and to say that this is a challenge to the EU, right, then you would bring in this point, right, to say that why is it a challenge to the EU? Because the EU, right, is based on the rule of law. It is based on codification. And that is why this remains as a challenge. You understand, the, you, you understand how to use the point? Is everybody clear on, on this argument down here? Anybody needs me to explain this, the connection again? Okay, right? Can I? Okay. All right. <coughs> okay. Uh, and then you need to talk about, remember I also last week I talked about the difference between signing a treaty and ratifying the treaty. Remember I mentioned this, right? There's two steps to it, right? Okay, yeah. So that's also what is indicated down here, all right? Uh, treaties also have to be amended. Remember just now I talked about enlargement and the importance of treaties, right? So treaties also have to be amended each time new member states have joined, right? And the treaties are there, right, to reform the EU's institutions. And what are the treaties based on? Again, codification of law. It's, it's le the legal basis, right? So the treaties are also a representation of that law. All right, so can you understand why I know I emphasized on the point earlier on? Okay, all right. All right, the Lisbon Treaty was the last amending one that came into force in December 2009, right? Okay, so this is what I was telling you just now. The next slide. Uh, this one this, this one is from the EU website. All right, this one's from the EU website, all right? So this is a snapshot of uh, the treaties. I know there are very, there are a lot of treaties to remember, right? Uh, but a couple that I think, you know, you... Actually, you know, all of these ones are important uh, down here, right? But just, you know, remember the gist of it, right? Okay, just remember the gist of it. So, like, sorry, for example, the Treaty of Nice, right, uh, is the one that um, attempted to streamline the in institutional system. Lisbon one uh, is about, you know, simplifying the working methods and the voting rules and uh, the newer structures. So that one, you know, the, maybe the last two, right, uh, I, the uh, Nice, right, Lisbon, sorry, Nice, Lisbon, right, uh, and the Maastricht, right, I think, I'll put it this way, lah. while I think all the treaties are relevant and important, right, uh, I think, you know, nobody should go to the exam with the intention of writing an answer on the EU if you have zero clue about what Treaty of Maastricht, Treaty of Nice, Treaty of Lisbon is, put it that way, right, that means I would say that I think you would need to know definitely these three these three treaties in particular, okay, right? Uh, and then, of course, you know, Treaty of Paris is the one that, you know, basically, is, you know, uh, you know, started the entire ECSC, all right? So that one, you know, automatically, you know, you would also know, so, uh, right, okay? But, you know, these are the major ones to actually pay attention to, all right, okay? All right, so, the, like I said, you know, the treaties are significant to know uh, because of the objectives of the EU become cemented, they are laid down, right, in the treaties. It spells out the rules, regulations, practices, principles, norms, institutions that are significant to the EU <clears throat> member states, right? How they should behave, how they should function. These basically encapsulate in legal forms, right? The rules of membership and the rules of behavior. Very simply, that's what the treaties are basically there for. And that's what they're all, you know, uh, signify, right? Okay, that, that's the rationale down here. Okay, all right.
domestic countries, right? Okay, national budget has to be in balance or surplus according to the treaty's definition, right? Um, and why is it that they want to ensure that the national budget is in balance or in surplus? Basically, you're talking about the health of the domestic economy of these individual states. If you're going to have right individual states with very unhealthy economies, like what you see in Greece with high levels of public debt, right? Uh, then that is going to be a burden on you know the entire health of the block, right? Okay, so that is the rationale down here. So what you know it what what is the implication or what is the aim of the fiscal compact? Two number one, reinforce budget discipline. All right, that's basically the idea down here, right? Reinforce budget discipline of the euro area governments. The rationale is that just because you are a member of the EU and you receive EU funding, right? It doesn't mean that you can be ill-disciplined, right, domestically and spend the money willy-nilly how you want to, you know, spend the money and then expect the EU, right, to continuously provide, you know, you handouts, right? That's the rationale down here, right? You want a healthy economy, right? Uh, ensure that your national budgets, you know, are balanced and in surplus, right? So that's the rationale down here. It is also, right, uh, to uh, emphasize those those that have signed it, right? You know, that means when you sign a treaty, remember the logic behind treaties, right? You know, it's part of a regime, right? The rationale is that, you know, it focuses on the norms, practices, and principles around which actors' expectations converge, right? So, those states that sign in and are part of this fiscal compact, right, they would then subsequently um, be subject to the recommendations, right, or you know, made by the EU Commission when the when they have public deficits that become too large. So if you're part of this fiscal compact, your budget deficit has become too large, European Commission makes a recommendation, you would more or less have to abide by it. Right? Okay? So you cannot say that, you know, um, I, I don't know, right? I don't know how to manage the thing, right? Okay, so that's the rationale, uh, you know, behind having states, you know, sign this con uh, sign this treaty as well, right? And lastly, right, is to improve the coordination of national economic policies. Because remember, at the end of the day, right, when you look at the EU, basically you're looking at a block of states. Useful word to use. Uh, again, this is another thing that I do not see students using in their arguments when they talk about EU. It's a block, Right, BLOC, right? At the end of the day, it's a block, right? So, you know, they basically, you have this, oh, I know why. This is directly under the speaker. Okay, that's why there's an echo kind of a thing, right? Is that an echo? No? Okay, that means it's just me hearing it. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Okay, so that's the rationale, right? Uh, you know, behind the uh, a fiscal compact like that, right? Okay, so what you want to include, right? You know, when you talk about these kinds of things, right? In terms of the health of the economy, uh, in in the block, right, is to ensure that you know they, uh, you know, are able to rise above the economic crisis, right? <coughs> and the rationale is that you know uh, you want to be able to explain, right, that you know the health of the of the the you know the European economy right is you know related to the current and future plans right so you know of course the economic crisis is one important point and then the other important point is about you know the different aspects that you know the EU is concerned with so things like you know your traditional your your you know the normal uh, issue areas that we refer to as twenty first century problems right so climate change gender equality right you know the different consequences related to these different issue areas, right? So these are the things that you would include, you know, when you talk about, uh, you know, moving forward, right? What are the hot button issues that EU needs to pay attention to, okay? All right? So that's what you want to emphasize. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, there's a squeaky feedback, is it? Sorry. Uh, hey, why is this not showing up? Okay. Uh, I, I do not know what to do because I, uh, the, the hey, why is it not showing up on the screen, huh? Why suddenly blank? Hello? This is Keltura. Oh, what do I do now? Um, okay, let's do this. 
Yeah, the screen is blank here. The screen is blank here. Is it? Is it? To, uh, I don't know what's wrong. Okay, let's do this. Um, what's my next slide anyway? Hold on, I can't even see because the slide is so small. Okay, let's do this. Let's take the let's take the lunch break now. All right, and then I will exit. Uh, people who are in the virtual class, I'm going to exit and I'm going to open up the Kaltura again. Okay. All right. Uh, everybody take the lunch break. It's one o. What's that? One o five. Come back by one twenty. have a quick discussion about the various um, institute sorry various organs within the EU and you want to just you know briefly mention right so what you could do is say for example okay let me give you an idea right how you could utilize uh, this this information right if you get an, uh, if you have an answer uh, a question right that is say for example on how decisions are made in the EU okay that kind of question or if you have a question that talks about, you know, uh, the empowerment, the strengthening of individual organs in the EU, all right? Okay, so these two types of questions, okay? All right. <clears throat> so, what you can do, right, is this. You would not have enough time or enough space in your, I mean, like, word limit or word count, right, in your exam. Uh, if you're going to go into extreme detail about each and every one of these organs, correct? I mean, then, you know, there will be no analysis. There will be just simply a scenario where you are just, you know, uh, regurgitating, you know, uh, textbook information about what these different organs are about, right? So what you can do is this. Have one, I'm giving you an idea, all right? Okay, it's just a suggestion, all right? Have one summary paragraph or one large summary paragraph that says, okay, within the EU, you have the European Council, you've got the Council of the European Union, you've got the European Parliament, the European Commission, the ECJ, the ECB, and the European Court of Auditors, all right? Okay, maybe you, can, you want, if you want, you can leave the auditors out there, right? But the other ones are the ones that we've mentioned in the lecture notes and in the subject guide so far. Right? So you can mention, okay, these are the various organs, right? Uh, generally, okay, uh, the European Council is a summit of the heads of government and provides the political impetus for the development of EU. So I summarise from there, I just mentioned two points, right? Then you go on to talk about, say, you know, one or two points about, you know, the Council of European Union. Uh, you know, it acts together with the Parliament as a legislature, uh, you know, it ensures coordination, right, uh, of the broad economic social policy, sets out guidelines. Then European Parliament exerts democratic control over the institutions. Then you move on to European Commission. Uh, it's the executive, it submits proposals, it implements policies, ECJ as well. Right? So that means basically each one of these different organs, you have like one or two points summary stuff. Then what you do is, depending on what the question is asking you for, right? Then you say, okay, um, you know, these are the various organs, you know, let's examine decision-making procedures specifically, right? Uh, you know, or for the purpose of this essay, I'm going to focus on examining the European Parliament and uh, say the Court of Justice, for example, right? Or European Parliament and the Council of the European Union, because these are both the legislature, right? And then you go into a little bit more detail, right? And then you have the rest of your answer. Right. This is a suggestion about how you could go about using the info down here, right? Because remember, you know, um, you looking at the question, right? You also have the ability to delineate and outline, right? Okay, which are the you know specific arguments that I want to focus on, right? So you know, when they ask you just you know if the question is so broad, it say you know how are decisions made in the EU? So decisions are made in the various organs. So you cannot just say oh I'm going to focus only on the European Parliament. Right, and only talk about European Parliament, correct? So the logic will be, you know, decision. So you, you know, you can start off by saying that decision making, decision making procedures occur in several of these of these different organs. Provide a relatively decent overview of all of these different organs, right? And then say, okay, let's focus specifically 
on one or two of these organs. It can be done like that. Provided you indicate to the marker, this is the structure of your exam answer and you are technically answering the question, right? Because, you know, the marker also cannot be expecting you, you know, to write, you know, in detail, right, all of these different uh, organs as well, right? But at least if you provide a cursory, uh, you, know, a, you know, a decent enough overview, that could be one method, right? Or you could focus on, you know, two or three of the, you know, different, uh, you know, um, uh, organs, right, you know, in terms of decision-making procedure, empowerment, and so on, right, depending on what the question is asking you for. So this is how you can utilize it, right? Don't just put it down for the sake of putting it down. You know, I, I am very concerned about students who are going to be writing answers, right, that are regurgitative in nature. These kinds of topics, right, always end up with answers that are regurgitative. I mean, it's basically what I read in your, in your answer script, right, is what I can find in the subject guide or what I can find on the EU website. And that is not, it doesn't, that, that is not skill. That is not, you know, a uh, technique or anything. That's not analysis, right? And that is not, those are not the answers that are going to score. So you need to, you know, know how to use the, the info, you know, in an analytical manner, right? So streamline, right? Summarize where you want and so on, okay? All right. Uh, so this one, um, I like that video, right? It is quite, uh, you know, uh, 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 it provides a good, you know, summary. Okay. Uh, you know, this is like what I mentioned to you. Um, I updated the statistic. It's 513.5 uh, 5 million. Uh, another recent statistic, uh, no, no, is as, as, I don't know what year that one is, as of 2017 or 18, I can't remember. Uh, but some of the recent statistics that I was looking at, right, uh, says that it's, you know, 400 plus million. So I'm getting conflicting statistics, right? Just use this one, right? Just use this one, okay? Um, I, I will admit, you know, the statistics are a little bit conflicting, so just use this one, okay? All right. Okay, let's look at decision-making procedures, right? Okay, like what I, you know, discussed uh, just now. Ayah. Yesterday was hard. Hold on, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Okay. Decision making procedure, right? Okay. Uh, what you want to explain is that the Council, all right, of the European Union, uh, please do not get confused. Huh? There is two of them that have similar name. One is European Council, the other one is Council of the European Union. So it's different. Okay. All right. So please be careful. Huh? Okay. All right. So this one we're referring to is the Council of the European Union. All right. Uh, it represents the EU member governments. Okay. And uh, what they did was they wanted to um, streamline voting. Uh, so streamline decision making. All right. So it went underwent the change in twenty fourteen. All right. So basically, what uh, you know this this uh, you know represents is this. Right. Can you please you know pay attention to this part here. Right. Double legitimation. Good phrase to use, right? In fact, the concept of legitimation is is something that is, uh, you know, a good phrase to use when you talk about, you know, uh, IOs in general when they are, you know, um, emphasizing decision making procedures, when they're emphasizing on um, streamlining, when they are talking about uh, any kind of law that is being implemented, right? Uh, when you talk about authority. When you talk about empowerment of the organs within the organization itself, the legitimation function is important, right? Why? Because legitimation is associated with the autonomy of the organization, right? That means I, if I perform a legitimation function, I am I as the organ or I as the state, basically, sorry, I as the organ and I as the IO, right? I am basically endorsing the actions of a, a, a member state, right? I'm providing legitimacy, right? Only if I say that, you know, I only if I support it, only if I provide this endorsement, right? Then that makes what your action correct, which means I have power, right? Correct? You understand the rationale down here, right? Okay. So that is important, okay? So adoption of EU legislation requires double legitimation. So the logic down here is that in that case, right, number one, the logic here is about, you know, where does the legislation come from? It comes from the Council of European Union, 
right? <coughs> and from the European Parliament. So it suggests to you that these two organs that form part of the legislature, right, within the EU, they are independent, they have authority, they are empowered. Okay, so that's one angle to it. The other angle, right, is that there's a check and balance, right, because of these two organs that are both legitimizing, right, and endorsing this particular legislation, right. So there's checks and balances. So you know, again, the argument, right, about you know, uh, you know, uh, arbitrarily imposing, you know, uh, laws, Brussels overstepping its boundaries, and so on. Again, you know, that kind of criticism sort of, you know, takes a beating when you indicate that, you know, there is double legitimation of uh, like any kind of legislation. So EU laws must garner 55% majority in EU governments, right? And this majority must represent at least 65% of EU's total population. If this double legitimation is absent, law cannot pass through. Right, so that means you know if you looking at the charges by states who say that you know uh, decisions are being made arbitrarily or you know my input is missing. If you're part of the European Parliament, which they will be part of the European Parliament because you know they have MEPs right who represent uh, the domestic governments in the European Parliament, then you know this logic of consensus uh, decisions being made by consensus it holds. Right, so that's the rationale down here. Right, okay. So this is what they refer to as the qualified majority voting. Okay, so the impact of the qualified majority voting. Right, uh, why did they want to bring it in in the first place? Right, because the system it makes the system more flexible. Right, and it will accommodate to an already enlarged EU membership and subsequent enlargements because that's what the EU is basically about. It's been taking on more and more members, right? Okay, so that's the rationale down here. What you also want to, uh, you know, highlight, right, uh, is that, you know, it has streamlined the, the first uh, the first sub-bullet point under QMB, right? It also streamlines the decision-making process. Previously, it was, you know, longer, more, you know, difficult negotiations between the different member states. They want to respond more quickly, more swiftly to decisions. That is what legislatures are basically all about. When you talk about, you know, decision-making processes or decision-making procedures, dispute resolution mechanisms, right? These are characteristics you would expect typically of these kinds of organs. You want decision-making to be swift, transparent, flexible, correct? You want decisions to be legitimate, you want decisions to come from right some kind of consensual basis as well. This is expected of any kind of parliamentary process, any kind of legislative process, any kind of legislature. In the EU, is no exception, right? Okay, so the you know the impact of QMB is more simpler, streamlined way of decision making, right? And very you know critical if you're expecting the EU to operate smoothly. Remember, always you know look back at the logic of the membership. Right, enlargement number one. Number two, right, very, uh, mem uh, sorry, members of very levels of development, very levels of capacity, capabilities, right, very political culture, right. They are different statuses. They have different political culture, different types of government, right. Some, you know, like like Orbán's government, you know, more illiberal, more authoritarian in nature. Then you've got Germany. Right, so you've got differences among all of these different, uh, you know, vari sorry, vari variations among all of these different member states. Right, so you would need, all right, a legislative process or a decision-making process that is simplified, flexible, streamlined, and so on. Right, and the rationale also, you know, why, you know, okay, uh, remember I pointed up this point, uh, the in in the original uh, bullet point down here, right? We're talking about, you know, uh, the EU governments, you know, uh, sorry, fifty-five percent majority of the EU governments and it must represent at least 65% of the EU total population. Why do we even mention that? Why do we talk about the population? The rationale here, right, is the <coughs> twofold nature of the EU. The EU is not simply, right, a union uh, or, you know, a, a, a grouping of states. It is also a grouping of people, right? Okay. Remember, um, was it last week's lecture or the week before? No, it was the week. It was the week before. Week before the first lecture on EU, lecture 14. Do you remember the two cases that we discussed right at the end by the ECJ? 
the the Van Gen and Loose Customs one, and then we had other case that we discussed, Costa versus Enel, the electricity board and Mr. Costa, who had bought shares, and then he said, you know, it's unconscious. Remember that one, right? Then we talked about the direct effect of the law, and that we said that the EU law has got implications not only on, uh, you know, the the you know, com- uh, not only on states, but as but on companies as well, which is in the case of Vanken and Luz, as well as the, you know, individuals like Mr. Costa from, you know, uh, I think it was Italy, right? Remember that argument? Yeah. So that's where what we are referring to down here as well, right? It's a union, you know, or a, a grouping of states as well as of the people, right? So, you know, the member states, you know, are respected, uh, you know, because they are representative of the people. And each one has got one vote, you know, while the different population sizes are also taken into account, right? That's why it is qualified majority voting, right? Because you're taking into consideration size of the population. Smaller states, you know, always tend to be overrepresented in these kinds of national legislatures and so on, right? Okay, so remember that is, you know, the rationale behind the qualified majority voting, right? So, you know, while, you know, some of us look at this, you know, term and say like, oh, qualified majority voting, very technical, you know, nature. What is the gist of it? What is the impact? What is the implication? All right? Okay. So, then you've got the decision-making, uh, you know, bodies within the EU. You've got the European Parliament. Of course, European Parliament represents EU citizens because you've got the MEPs, right? The members of the European Parliament and uh, voters, you know, directly vote for the MEP, right? Uh, you've got the European Council. Right, which is the heads of government. They are the ones who conduct the summit. They provide the political direction and the political impetus. This is why I give you that snapshot of all the different organs within the EU, right? Because that gives you the idea, you know, what uh, each of these form. Council of European Union, which is part of the legislature, and the European Commission, which represents the interests of the EU as a whole. All right, okay. Then what you want to... Uh, okay, these are the different videos. Take a look at that one. Uh, especially take a look at the one about the European Parliament elections, right? Uh, it gives you a clear idea, you know, exactly how MEPs get voted into the the uh, EP. All right, okay. So take a look at that one. It's quite a short video. Like, all by... These are not technically... I think most of these videos are actually by the EU itself, right? So factually, they are correct, Okay. Okay, all right. Uh, okay, this one here, important. Can you please, uh, you know, uh, put an asterisk on this slide, right? Because this one uh, basically explains to you uh, the, the veracity uh, and the significance of the different kinds of decisions that are made in the EU, okay? All right. If you look at the, you know, these different types of decisions, right? There are different categories of decisions. The only one, that is not binding, right, are recommendations and opinions. The other three, regulation, directive, and decisions, right, all are binding in nature, right, meaning that, you know, uh, the, the, you know but they're binding on the state, lab, right, okay? So if you look at regulation, uh, it is technically we're referring to law that is applicable, binding in all member states, right, but it does not necessarily have to be passed into national law by the member state, okay? But what happens is that you may have a scenario where the local laws or the domestic laws, they need to be amended to avoid conflict with the, you know, these uh, regulations that are, you know, being passed down, right? So it is binding, number one. Number two, regulations uh, do not have to be implemented or, you know, turned into national law in the member states, but member states may need to amend domestic laws in order to avoid conflict or clashes, which you would understand why, right, uh, some of these states, like, you know, say, for example, Hungary may have an issue with, you know, regulations and, and decisions, uh, regulations and, and, and uh, you know, uh, legislations like these because they have to basically make amendments to their uh, domestic law in order to avoid avoid clashes. If you're a state that is, you know, um, strongly, you know, uh, you know, attempting to defend your sovereignty and, and finding all of this in a front, right, then obviously you would go, you know, at loggerheads with uh, the EU, right? Directive is the law that binds member states, right, and they must be transposed into national law in order to be effective. So regulation, no need to turn into national law. Directive must turn into national law, right? Significant because uh, you know, it specifies, you know, what result is to be achieved by the national government, right? And it is, you know, um, that means basically it's like EU passes down this directive and expects 
the member states to incorporate this directive into their domestic law. How you incorporate this directive into your you know, domestic law is up to you, but it should be incorporated into your domestic law. Right? Okay, you understand the rationale down here? Okay. The third one, right, decisions, they can be addressed to member states, groups of people, or even individuals, right? So, you know, um, say for example, uh, like the direct effect that we saw Bankian and Luz or Costa versus Enel, direct decisions are used to rule on things like proposed budgets between different companies, right, as a result of the customs and so on, okay? So these are the three different types uh, of laws, uh, oh, sorry, three different types of legislations that are binding. Recommendations, opinions have got no binding force, right, okay? So, of course, you know, in comparison to say, like, for example, the, you know, UN, right, it definitely does, you know, signify far more empowerment strength, right, on the part of the EU as an IO in comparison <coughs> to the, in comparison to other organizations like the UN, right, okay? Uh, so, you know, that is, you know, if you're making an argument for a question that talks about, oh, uh, the EU is an organization that requires states to pool their sovereignty, uh, together, uh, pull their resources together and, you know, uh, to give up some of their sovereignty or reinterpret what sovereignty means, then the decision-making pro process where you specifically talk about how these different kinds of legislations are binding, right, that would be an argument that you would include. Because this does affect state sovereignty to some extent, correct? So it's related to the sovereignty argument, okay? Are we clear on this one? All right? Okay. <coughs> All right, so this one here, all right, uh, this one basically is an explanation about how the EP and the um, and the, uh, uh, the Council, right, of European Union, they share uh, legislative power, right? Remember just I talked about the checks and balances that I was referring to, the double legitimation process, right? Okay, so Council EP each read and discuss whatever proposal, uh, and the rationale is that it must be uh, approved, right? The Council if it approves the EP position, the European Parliament position, then of course, no problems. It will, you know, be adopted and it's proposed by, you know, adopted as proposed by the EP, right? So in, in this, if you want to rephrase this, right, basically the council can function as a veto player because the council has to approve the EP's position, right? The EP in this case, they are, you know, uh, proposing the legislation, right? Okay. What happens is that, how do you interpret that? They are the agenda setters, right? Or they, you know, they set the agenda, right? Okay, right? Uh, and then, you know, if there's a disagreement, then obviously, uh, you know, you know the, the council will explain, okay, what is their position? Why is it that they are disagreeing? The commission also will get involved, right? And, you know, allow the EP to know what, you know, why they're opposing uh, it, right? Okay. So, uh, they then they go into the second reading, right? If they, you know, find that, okay, there are no other issues, then, you know, it becomes law, right? But the council position, you know, uh, is the one that will be supreme in this case, right? Then subsequently, if, you know, no agreement is reached, right, then it will go before a conciliation committee, right? And then, you know, uh, they would basically... So, the question down there that I have, you know, when, you know, can a legislation or when an act fails, right, is when it comes to this stage and the conciliation committee, they also cannot come to any kind of agreement, right, on a joint text when, you know, majority of the MEPs in the EP, if they reject what is proposed by the conciliation committee as well, right, then your legislation will fail. What does this tell you? It tells you that there are many different steps, right, associated with legislation. Is it arbitrarily passed down by a few decision makers? It isn't, right? Okay, so that's the rationale that, you know, that is why we're explaining this process down here, right? Because we are, you know, it's an attempt to show you the detail, the details, right, that go into the legislative process, right? And, you know, how each of these actually become law, right? So then to come to that argument to say that, you know, uh, the laws are invasive, right? We do not agree with the laws. They take away from, you know, or the imposing Brussels viewpoint, is it, and you know, when you look at all of these arguments, right, uh, say like, you know, the, the, the media articles that, you know, uh, highlight, you know, uh, uh, Polish and, you know, Hungarian unhappiness, right? You notice they always will say, Brussels is overbearing, right? It, uh, you know, it reflects bureaucratic authoritarianism from Brussels, right? Is it purely Brussels per se, right, that is making all of these decisions? 
or you know it goes through these kinds of complex processes right that uh you know have got various levels of checks and balances right so the accusations you know by hungary or poland you know they've been taken with a pinch of salt as well okay all right Okay, so for a modified act to pass, majority of MEPs, which are representative of the population, right, uh, and a qualified majority of the council members, they must vote in favour. All right, simple enough. Okay, all right. National parliaments will then receive the draft legislative acts, right? Uh, they can give their opinion as well. So it even comes from the domestic level, right? And, you know, it ensures that, you know, whatever that's being translated into domestic law or whatever directives that they have to follow, right? They are all, you know, taken at the most appropriate level. Okay, look at the last bullet point on this slide. Please underline that. Principle of subsidiarity. Please underline or, or, or highlight that. Okay. Do you remember uh, when we did, uh, I mean, if you have done Intro to Political Science, right, when you've done the chapter on federalism, okay, we talked about the principle of subsidiarity, all right, okay, it's, it's related to that concept. And basically what the principle of subsidiarity basically uh, highlights, right, is that when you have multiple levels of decision, multiple levels of decision making, vertical, that means decision making, decision making is in a vertical process. You've got like, you know, an overarching authority and then you've got like domestic governments or, or domestic levels, right? Okay, right. Just like how you see in federalism, you've got central government and then you've got local level government, right? Okay. When you talk about principle of subsidiarity, the logic is this. Whatever that can be effectively done at the local level or the lower levels should be they should be allowed to carry it out right this reduces the um the logic of an overbearing you know central authority this allows higher empowerment of these lower levels, right? That's the rationale behind subsidiarity, right? So except in the areas where it has exclusive powers. Remember when we talked about federalism also, I don't know uh, whether, you know, all of y'all took uh, intro to political science. Um, when we talked about, you know, the different areas, policy areas where the, you know, central government has got power over, right? Those are referred, can you please write it down? Those are referred to competences. Remember this phrase? Competences. Competence. C-O-M-P-E-T-E-N-C-E. -E -E. Competence. This is basically referring to policy areas, right? This will come back, you know, uh, again, right? You know, when you when you have that argument about intergovernmentalism and supranationalism, right? This is, you know, the, the rationale down here. Policy areas. So competences refer to policy areas like, say, for example, education uh, refers to things like uh, healthcare, right, uh, you know, uh, defense, right? These are different competences, right? So, of course, <clears throat> in certain areas, right, the, you know, the, the EU, right, will, you know, ha has got uh, exclusive powers in particular areas, say, for example, where they want to discuss, you know, uh, you know the EMU, where they want to talk about, you know, the particular treaties and so on, right? That will come under the aegis of, you know, all of these central organs, right? But the EU only acts where action will be more effective at, EU level than at national level. So whatever can be done by domestic governments, wherever domestic governments, you know, can implement policy, provide input and so on, it should be, it, it is, it should be and it is done at the national level. Understand? Okay. So that means, again, there is this logic about <coughs> is national, sorry, are national considerations or domestic considerations completely sideswept by the, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, organs at the Brussels level? And the answer is obviously no. Okay? All right? So that's the logic of the principle of subsidiarity. Okay? All right? Okay. All right. This one here, the EEAS. Okay? All right? So the EEAS, uh, remember in the Lisbon Treaty, right? You know, they wanted to create, uh, you know, and, and the treaty prior to that, right? Uh, they wanted to create, you know, uh, uh, like a foreign minister position within the, the EU, right? <coughs> and 
it didn't quite take off under the treaty prior to the Lisbon Treaty, right? But they did, you know, manage to create the position of the High Representative uh, for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy under the Lisbon Treaty, right? So this was, you know, um, uh, the creation of this. Uh, what they refer to as the European External Action Service, right? It's a bureaucratic apparatus for the high representation, uh, high, high, uh, sorry, high representative, right? Uh, it is staffed by civil servants from the Commission, uh, as well as different diplomatic corps from the EU member states, right? Basically, what they wanted to do is they wanted to uh, be able to create an, an office, right, that deals with the logic of EU foreign policy. Because remember, we talked about this rationale, uh, you know, of the EU dealing with the other states external to the EU, right, uh, as a bloc, right. So that means all of the EU members, right, are seen as one, right, and they want to have a foreign policy approach, right, to a foreign policy outreach to other, you know, uh, different states, right? So that is why they wanted to have the EAS, right? It's to ensure greater consistency, coordination, and relevance of EU foreign uh, policy. So basically, you know, what they refer to as foreign policy, they call it external action, right? They don't call it foreign policy per se, because if you say foreign policy, then, you know, that is something that is prerogative of an individual state, so they call it external action, okay? Um <clears throat> The EEAS, you know, has been uh, largely criticised. Uh, you know, uh, the two videos down there basically highlight the criticism uh, that, you know, they have not been, uh, that, you know, it, it has not lived up to its uh, uh, name because uh, there has not been a lot of co cooperation or coordination. That was what they created the EEAS for, right? To have coordination and consistency and cooperation, you know, uh, among the different member states with regards to external action, right, or foreign policy. But they have not actually been, uh, you know, so successful in that sense, right? So you can watch that video. Uh, and the last, the second one is a more recent one about, you know, um, not having, um, you know, can the EAS, you know, basically, uh, you know, overcome all of these troubles and work efficiently, even if, you know, they don't have any kind of consensus on, uh, you know, EU common global role. Why I picked that video and I, and I wanted you to take a look at it is this, you know, um, argument. Because remember, uh, at the end of the day, the EU is seen in two ways. One, as a regional organisation. Two, right, as an international organization, right? So, you know, some of the critics or some of observers, you know, will ask, right, uh, you know, basically, you know, um, does the EU uh, engage in mission creep, right, uh, if it starts to play a larger, you know, or attempts to play a global role, right? So that's why, you know, I, I picked that video for you to take a look at, right? Okay, so you can take a look at the EEAS. <clears throat> then you've got the European Central Bank, right? And I'm sorry, this part is a bit dry, right? So I'm going to, that's why I'm trying to run through, you know, with just the main details, you know, as, as fast as possible. Let me get to the juicy arguments subsequently, all right? Okay, all right, I, I know it's a bit dry. All right, so the European Central Bank is one of the, you know, uh, central banks in in the world that is considered to be like the most independent central bank, right? In comparison to several other central banks. Um it is part of the ECB, right? Uh, sorry, it's part of the Eurozone. The ECB basically uh, <clears throat> is, uh, you know, the principal objective, right, is to ensure that, you know, it dry administers and drives monetary policy. Uh, it is to ensure price stability, so maintaining the value of the euro vis-a-vis -vis other currencies. Remember when the euro first broke out, right, uh, it was not something that, you know, all states within the European Union were interested in adopting all right it, you know i think when they first uh, implemented it i think out of all the uh, out of all the eu members i think only up to about 11 of them right uh, basically implemented the euro initially then subsequently more of them you know came on board right uh, and it you know it has become one of the most influential central banks uh, you know in the world today right um, and the eurozone in uh, you know per se represents you know a very large chunk of the global economy Right, uh, and despite uh, you know the instability of the euro over the last couple of years and the Greek crisis, right? Take a look at the the video on you know why Greece has so much debt. Right, uh, you will see that you know the ECB has still you know played off uh, played a, a very large role. Right, uh, look at the video. Right, when we talk about the European Financial Stability Facility, what that refers to the E, <coughs> sorry, the EFSF. 
All right, what that refers to uh, is about, um, it's similar to like the role and function that maybe the IMF plays, right? Because the IMF, you know, uh, is about, uh, you know, and, and the World Bank, right? Both of these, right? They are about, you know, contributing to the health of the international financial system, right? And they deal with things like, you know, uh, issuing bonds and dealing with debt instruments and so on. The EFSF actually performs a similar function, right? Is to uh, keep up financial stability in the Eurozone by issuing bonds, debt instruments on the capital market, right? So that's where, you know, it is slightly similar uh, to the bond issuing facility and the debt instrument facility that uh, the IMF and the World Bank actually have. Okay? But I wouldn't make the direct comparison. I'm just giving you, you know, that idea to think about. Okay? All right. Okay, so the, you know, that that uh, dry part is now over. Now we look at the institutional effects. Okay? So this is where, you know, uh, the arguments are a little bit more interesting. All right? Uh, you know, that you can, uh, you know, you can make. Right? Okay. So what you want to, you know, highlight, uh, and I'll come back to this argument about Euroscepticism, right, uh, towards the end of the discussion. Uh, but, you know, discuss uh, the logic of Euroscepticism, right, uh, when you want to talk either about the effect of the EU, number one, right, or you can discuss it as a challenge that the EU faces, okay? All right, uh, so institutional, uh, you know, effect of the, you know, remarkable success, you know, continuous development of, you know, the, the you know, the EU, right? And that starts to draw scorn from those that, you know, um, are basically afraid uh, of the other. You know, that's what, you know, what Euroscepticism is, is basically about, right? They are those that oppose, um, you know, the the creation of the EU, they are those who feel that, um, you know, you have an overbearing uh, mechanism, right, within the EU, like the overblown Brussels bureaucracy. They feel that the EU is basically engaging in mission creep and infringing on the sovereignty status of each of these member states, right? Okay, so we will look at that in more detail, right? The And, and you know, the fears... And these charges or these allegations by, uh, you know, these Eurosceptics, right? They are not, you know, entirely unfounded, you know. Meaning, when you say it's not entirely un unfounded, meaning that there's a rationale or there's a basis as to why they have, you know, come up with these kinds of criticism. Because obviously, when you see the organisation becoming larger, you look at the various treaties that have consistently worked to increase the reach of, the individual organs, you have the deepening, the broadening, the largening, the, sorry, enlargening, the enlargement, not largening, sorry, enlargement of the organization, right? Which means that, you know, the larger, the more empowered it becomes, the more autonomous it becomes, the more effect it has on individuals, on states, and on companies, or all of these different political actors, because it is no longer, you know, you look at other international organizations, it's organization, and state, right? The EU is different. It is organization and various political actors, right, within the EU, because we talk about it's a grouping of states, right? It tackles businesses. It also talks about impact on the citizens, right? So, of course, right, it is going to garner these kinds of, or attract these kinds of negative allegations or, you know, uh, you know, the, you know the, the fear, Right, that they're encroaching on the sovereignty of, 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 of states, right? So, you know, obviously, you know, the addition of more member states, you know, has caused the, you know, the delegation of more authority to the European Commission, the institutionalization and empowerment that we you know we referred to, right? So you can talk about, you know, the mission creep, or you can just say, you know, creeping power of the EU, right? Uh, you know, was basically, you know, part of the failure of the 2004 constitutional treaty. This is the, the treaty that was before the Lisbon Treaty. Right, the 2004 constitutional one was the one where they attempted to create that foreign minister position that it didn't take off. Remember, we talked about this last week, uh, right? So that was why you had the failure, right, of these kinds of treaties because you know anything that attempts to empower the organization even more starts, you know, to be viewed with a very, uh, you know, suspicious lens, right? Okay. Then you've got the single European Act, right? We've talked about this before already, right? And remember, I mentioned that how that this was a cornerstone of the EU. 
All right. And what you want to highlight is that, you know, there are, you know, several different areas, right, uh, you know, for legislative uh, initiatives, right? So they have got, you know, areas of involvement. Remember the competences I referred to? This is the competences, right? Okay. So areas in, of involvement, they have got the, the specific uh competences that are exclusive to you know eu authority right is uh external trade competition policy commercial policy agriculture fisheries and so on right okay then also uh monetary policy is another uh you know exclusive area so it's another exclusive competence right so the rationale is that um the other areas where perhaps you would say they have shared competences Right. Can you see the difference, right? The first one down here, EU areas of involvement, almost exclusive authority in these kinds of competences, agriculture, fisheries, commercial policy. Then monetary policy is also uh, a core competence, right, belonging to the EU. Then you have uh, important but not exclusive roles, suggesting there's shared, shared responsibility, right, between EU level and domestic level, right, in policy making, you know, anything regarding things like environment, occupational health and safety, uh, you know, cross-border crime, transport, all of these things, where it plays a lesser role, that means doesn't have that much say, right, the domestic governments, you know, basically have got more say, right, will be things like taxation, defense, individual States obviously retain control over, you know, defense or foreign policy, right? Social policy, healthcare, and so on, which is your traditional stronghold of sovereign states. This is, remember, just I talked about the principle of subsidiarity? This one, yeah, right? So whatever that is best left to the hands of, you know, the lower level or the domestic states, right? That is what they are going to pay attention to, right? Okay. And then where they have no role in is obviously things like culture, Right, housing policy and so on. Culture, you want to uh, underline, underline culture, right, right down there. Cross reference, cross reference, right, to arguments on migration crisis. All right, <coughs> cross reference to Hungary. All right, Victor Orban's, you know, arguments, uh, you know, and and his uh, defense. Right of not wanting to have you know a high number of Muslim uh, immig migrants, right? Uh, you know, asylum seekers, right, going into Hungary. All right, migrant crisis. I'll explain the migrant crisis in a little bit. Okay. All right. Cross reference that because you know if culture, if the EU has got no a uh, say on that, on 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 culture, and if you position that as you know your culture being Im negatively impacted by asylum seekers migrants if and, and if you claim that they come from you know particular uh in ethnic cultures or ethnic groups or particular states right that are uh, you know muslim in nature then you know that argument would fit in together you understand the rationale down here right and also remember maybe you want to write down there also right if you're relating it to asylum seekers you know defense of christian culture and so on by particular states like hungary for instance right also remember right islam is one of the fastest growing religions uh, in Europe, right? I think it was, uh, I think initially, I think it was like the third fastest growing religion. And uh, more recent statistics have shown, right? Islam is one of the, you know, major uh, religions in Europe today, right? And that has been a cause of tension, right? Okay, okay. So that's where, you know, you bring in that argument as well. But, but be careful, please be careful. I, I want to reiterate this. Uh, I don't think I've actually mentioned this in class before because there was no need to prior to this right but if if you are going to talk about a uh, migrant crisis if you are going to talk about you know um uh like uh rise of islam these kinds of things right uh or you know the euro skeptic take on the rise of islam and so on please be sensitive please write in a neutral manner please don't uh, you know, right in such a way where the language or the tone is harsh and then you sound like, you know, anti whatever religion or something, right? Okay. Uh, I, I, I noticed this. Um, I don't think this is so much a problem for this course, but I noticed this in particular when students write about terrorism and so on, right? It becomes very problematic. Uh, please be, you know, extremely careful. 
right? Uh, as as uh, you know, sometimes when I also read, you know, uh, students' essays, right? I'm like, you know, it it, it touches. I, I I'm not Muslim, right? But you know, uh, what I'm saying is that when the language is harsh, and when you inadvertently you know label things wrongly, right? Uh, it comes across as a biased answer, right? And, uh, you know, it makes it very difficult as uh, students, as academics, right? You want to make sure your your language is neutral. So please be careful when you write about migrant crisis and these kinds of things, right? Uh, please, you know, uh, write. This I notice when I, when I mention things, I'll say critics mention, observers mention, right? I use more neutral language, right? And I would, you know, recommend that you do that also. Please be careful about these kinds of things, all right? Particularly, you know, if you're going to be referring to culture, you're going to be referring to uh, Orban's, you know, take on this, right? Uh, please be careful also, all right? Okay, let's look at this concept down here. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I, let me just uh, finish off this, you know, when I was talking about the competencies, right? Okay. Uh, what you want to, uh, uh, okay, I don't know. I did mention it. I, I did mention it. Uh, the expansion, the expansion of the areas of the competencies, right? Uh, what you you know want to highlight is that this causes tension, right? When they feel that you know, say for example, you know the areas of involvement like you know the agriculture or the commercial policy or the monetary policy, this this um, you know uh, competencies that belong to the EU, this is a cause of tension by those who feel that the EU has basically overstepped its boundaries, right? Okay, so that's what I wanted to mention about the competencies. All right, now you look at the socialization. Where did we hear this from? Remember uh, the social constructivism argument, the socialization function that IOS uh, perform. All right, okay, all right, so that's the connection there. Okay, so remember, you know, go back you know, when it, and if you're going to talk about, uh, let me uh, remind you, if you're going to talk about the EU as an organization that performs a socialization function, then you have to first explain the logic of socialization, right? Okay, you cannot just jump into the argument straight away, right? So you talk about, you know, the rationale of how IOs, you know, um, you know they uh, those that have autonomy, those that, you know, are able to perform these kinds of functions, right? They are norm entrepreneurs. Remember that phrase that we use when we talk about IOs? They're norm entrepreneurs. Repeated, in, uh, repeated uh, reiteration of norms, right, uh, make them ingrained, right, in the states, right? So states come to adopt these norms. They are internalized. So these are all the vocabulary, right, that you need to use when you talk about the logic of socialization. Okay, remember? All right, you know, all of these arguments are related to the social constructivism logic. Alistair Ian Johnson, remember, uh, you know, the social persuasion, uh, and, and influence, remember? We talked about this, uh, social influence and persuasion, right? We talked about this before, okay? So the IOs, basically, they are inducting, right? Or they are helping these member states, right? To internalize these worldviews that, you know, they have. Basically, you know, uh, come, uh, you know, getting them to internalize these rules of membership and rules of behavior, right? Okay, so that is what the socialization basically is about, okay? So what you want to uh, explain here, right, is that, you know, while you find that, you know, the the states have become socialized and, you know, the, the, the staff have also become socialized into adopting these EU-style norms, right? Okay. Uh, the rationale, you know, is that when they did some surveys and they looked at the MEPs, they looked at the, the officials in the EU, right? They, you know, appear to be more pro-European than, you know, the national elites or national publics, right? But the logic here is that they... It's not a case where they've been brainwashed by the EU. They are not, you know, pro-European because, you know, these European norms, you know, uh, they didn't embrace them because it you know, originated in the European Commission. But it's, you know, more or less a case where, you know, it's national socialization, right? Uh, it's a you know, result of national socialization, meaning that basically everybody is on board. Everybody understands, you know, the rationale behind these particular principles and practices that have been, you know, encouraged, embraced by, you know, the EU and so on, right? And same thing, you know, when they looked at uh, the MEPs, right? Scully looked at, you know, examined the MEP, MEPs' attitudes, right, uh, and behavior and found that, you know, the, the, the usual charge uh, is actually false, right? The MEPs are basically, you know, have remained largely national, 
politicians. They, because at the end of the day, the members of the European Parliament, they're directly elected right, by the peoples. right. So they are actually national representatives. That means they are representing their republics right, in the European Parliament. So their attitudes, their loyalties, right, uh, you know, and a lot of their activities, you know, are actually national in nature. That means they're still looking out for the national interests of their states. It's not that they've been, you know, swept up in, you know, the, uh, you know, in the wave of, you know, uh, Europeanization and so on, right? So, you know, you know, it's not a case where they've become more pro-integration, right? Uh, you know, it's more a case where they, uh, you know, are socialized into the EU, right? Um, you know, and the logic is that, you know, when we talk about the the new functionalist and the supranational arguments, right, that a lot of scholars put forth, increasingly a lot of scholars today find that argument a little bit misleading. Because remember, we talked about new functionalism and supranationalism, right? And that argument was basically saying that integration is an uncontrollable wave, right? And everybody is just swept up in the momentum. Of you know what the EU represents, right? But looking at how decisions are made that what we examine today, looking at this logic of socialization, looking at you know who the MEPs actually represent, what interests they basically have at heart, right, would make you you know be more inclined to believe that actually the EU is a representation of intergovernmentalism. There is still you know relative control, right, or Maybe control is too strong a word to use, right? But there's still, you know, it's still a case where your individual states, right, still retain some kind of authority. They still have some say, right? Your MEPs are still national in outlook, right? So, you know, intergovernmentalism may actually be a more, you know, accurate uh, description of what the EU has come to represent. Right. Even, you know, if you look at the institutionalization and the strengthening of all of the different decision-making institutions and the procedures and all the organs and so on, at the end of the day, it still is consensus basis. It still takes into account, you know, the checks and balances that are inbuilt into the system. So the strengthening of the organs within the EU does not necessarily equal to an increase in loss of sovereignty on the part of the member states. I think that is an important argument to take into consideration, right? Okay, all right, okay. So that is the rationale down here. So even if you talk about, you know, when it's binding, when legislation is binding, yeah, it is binding, but it only becomes binding after all of these different actors who are involved in the decision-making process have agreed upon that legislation, correct? So if you skip that decision-making process and talked about how there are checks and balances, how there's a double legitimation process, how the NEP, uh, so how the EP and the council come to a decision, when can a legislation fail and not even become legislation at all? If you skip all of that and just say, oh, you know, the regulations are binding, the you know directives are binding. Right? Decisions are binding and therefore it eats into the sovereignty of the, you know, the state then isn't that an inaccurate description, right? Because you have not, you have ignored, right? How they actually arrived at this legislation, which is binding, correct? You understand the rationale now here? You understand why it was important to look at, you know, the double legitimation and, you know, the decision-making process? You understand? Okay? Okay? All right. Okay. <coughs> okay? All right. Okay. So, EU as an IO. Right. Okay. We've uh, you know looked at you know all of these different arguments already. Right. So you know think about it in terms of you know, uh, you know what is the EU's projected political identity? What does it actually represent? Right. Uh, is it a security community? Is it you know uh, a bastion of, uh, you know European identity? Is it a representation of democratic values? Right? Uh, does it represent a hundred eighty degree turn from what the what what the region used to be characterized by competition and conflict, and now this is a beacon of uh, cooperation? Right? Okay. What is the kind of culture of anarchy that it represents, and so on? Okay. All right. Okay. So basically, what you know you want to you know discuss, right, is that <clears throat> please do not take you know the argument that it is so unique you cannot identify it. You know, it's not sui, sui generis, right? It is difficult to define. Yes, uh, but you know, 
<laughs> what some of the authors, you know, refer to it, you know, it's something of an enigma, right, by Armstrong, Redman and Lloyd. Uh, you know, it's a mix. That's what I say. It's, it's a very special organization, right? It is, you know, regional. It is international. It is political. It is diplomatic. It is economic. It's financial. You know, it's got many different, you know, aspects that we've actually examined, right? Um, and, you know, if you think about, you know, how, what, what, what is the EU actually all about, right? It spends over 95% of its budget on actual policies and on administration, it really does work for the peoples and for the states, right? Okay, uh, And it's considered to be an unfinished evolutionary organization. Please underline that. I think that is a good statement, uh, you know, to use as part of a conclusion, right? Uh, you know, if you're going to talk about, you know, how the EU should move forward or moving forward, what's going to happen, right? Uh, difficult to make a prediction, as to, as to exactly what's going to happen. That's why, you know, when, when Brexit was occurring, I was telling those batches of students, please, you know, do not go with the flow of all the YouTube videos and all of these pundits, right, who are basically arguing and saying that, you know, EU is going to fall apart, you know, like, haha, four years later, five years later, right, it's still going strong, right? Uh, you know, and, and look who is the one who is basically facing, you know, an increased amount of paperwork and, you know, customs complications and so on, right? Uh, you know, so the rationale down here is that, you know, it's an unfinished, you know, evolutionary organization. Why so? Because, you know, it evolved from the European steel and coal communities in the post-World War II period. Look at what we started off by discussing, right? You know, the logic of open diplomacy, the rationale that states, some states didn't have coal, some states didn't have steel, and that's why they started, you know, to exchange, they wanted to recover the economy, and what it actually represents today. Right. So the rationale is that, you know, you know, from ECSA and the European communities now as the EU, right, it will continue to evolve as the needs, the wants, the requirements of the increasing number of members, right, you know, would demand. Also remember, right, why, you know, do we call it unfinished evolutionary organization? Right? I think you need to also indicate that the environment in which the EU also operates, it's not static. Remember, I think I've used this phrase with y'all before, the logic about the political and the policy context. I mean, the environment in which it, it, it exists, right? That is also changing, okay? So that is also something that you need to think about, right? You know, look at, you know, over the you know, vast number of years, you know, uh, 1970s, you've got, you know, economic crisis. 2008 economic crisis, right? Uh, now you've got COVID-19, you know, uh, res uh, requirement to respond to the pandemic and so on, right? Uh, and as a result of the pandemic, you've got, you know, uh, economies have taken a beating, uh, you know, rise in uh, climate change issues and so on, right? So the environment in which, you know, the organization also functions, right, uh, is, is also not static. So if the political and policy context is also changing, Right, then, of course, the, the, the organization also will need to respond to the changes. Therefore, right, you know, the best way to describe it is an evolutionary organization. Because going, remember I showed you all the different treaties just now to show you how you know, it has you know, empowered, it has, you know, every time you have got new members, you know, they make amendments and so on. Right? So this is an accurate description. It, I wouldn't call it a cop-out right, you know, because, it, it, because, because I'm not just saying it's, it's unfinished. I'm giving you rationale. Why I've come to this conclusion, why, why I say it's evolutionary. So if you just say it's an evolutionary organization, full stop, and you do not discuss the rationale behind that comment, right? Then it's a cop-out to say that, uh, you know, you're basically saying, I don't know what it's going to be like subsequently. That, 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 that is a cop-out. But if you say that, if you put that statement in and provide some of the justifications that I gave you just now, right? Then that would make more sense. You understand? And then you can link this. Can you can you write down here? You can link this point, right, to what I've mentioned towards the end of the discussion, where we talk about the different ways you can think of the EU moving in, like the you know EU as an a la carte, like an a la carte menu, right? Uh, you know, multi speed, multi tier. It's you know towards the end of the lecture notes, right? Uh, uh, I do not know what slide it's on. Right, you can think of it, you know, make, make a connection, right? There, right? So that's why you say it's evolutionary, it's unfinished, because these are the different directions you think it can go towards. Right. So can you write down there? Uh link this to uh last slide on moving forward, right? Uh okay, wait, 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 hold on, hold on. If I hold on now, wait, wait, wait. Uh. It is the uh, this one, this one, slide 43. 
that I know because I highlighted it. All right, can you can you write down then link to slide forty three, the points on slide forty three about the a la uh, uh, you know a la carte euro uh, a la carte EU right the multi speed or multi tier EU okay all right link it to that okay all right <clears throat> okay uh, this one here very simple I've mentioned this many times so I'm not going to run through uh, much right uh, the EU is you know seen as you know a model or like a benchmark of you know what what you know um, you know for other regions to you know uh, formulate uh, organizations you know uh, similar to it right like say for example African Union all right uh, was basically formulated uh, oh, sorry organization of African unity right and African Union was basically you know created in the likes you know of wanting to um, be similar to the uh, EU we've got the Eurasian Union also but very importantly what you need to highlight is that it cannot be replicated it cannot be duplicated it's impossible to do so right okay uh, you know the rationale is that it is uh, the EU is a product of a unique time a unique time frame right a unique unique circumstances right and will continue to remain outside the behavioral norms of other IOs. What we've examined in the last three lectures, compared to what we've talked about, you know, in other like in, in other you know IOs like IMF or World Bank or NATO, completely different, right? Okay, so you know, um, you know, it, it the the circumstances that supported regional integration, you know, in the European region, right, cannot be found in other regions, right? So what at, at best, at best, right? I think that's a good phrase to use. At best, right, uh, the EU still can be used as a guide or a benchmark to, you know, say that this is what regional governance can look like, the potential, right, that it can look like, okay? All right, now we look at the different challenges, okay? I'm going to run through this relatively quickly because, you know, um, you know, it's kind of like all there for you, right? I want to pick up only the main points, you know, to discuss, right? So uh, you've got the banking crisis and the resultant uh, euro crisis for this. Please make sure you watch the video on the Greek euro, uh, the Greek crisis, right? Why does Greek have, uh, Greece have so much debt and so on, right? Okay, <coughs> what you want to highlight is this. When you talk about the crisis, particularly this point, I want to show you this, this, uh, technique or this, you know, uh, uh, analytical angle, right? Okay. When you talk about challenges, when you talk about crisis, and I'm going to use the same method when I talk about the Polish case and the Hungarian case as well, right? Okay. What you do is when you look at the challenge or the crisis, say for example, this one, right? Uh, you know, the resultant Euro crisis. You explain what the crisis is about, where it came from, right? And then what you highlight is that this crisis serves as a catalyst or a stepping stone, right? Because it identifies the flaws or the shortcomings that are in the system at the point, at this point, right? So that is what the, 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 the result is that it creates, like this, what I've got the second bullet point for you, right? It creates more mechanisms to deal with the economic crisis like the banking union. Uh, a common system for winding up the banks in serious financial difficulty, the EFSF, which will serve as a bailout fund for future acute debt situation. So the rationale is that when you have the crisis, does it mean it's doomsday? Not necessarily, right? Especially with an organization, and this is important, right? You need to justify the argument here, right? Especially with an organization that has actually faced so many ups and downs and had hit rock bottom in the 1970s as a result of, you know, the, you know, the major financial crisis, you know, the Great Depression, uh, sorry, the Great Inflation of the 1970s and the oil crisis and so on. And repeatedly, you know, re notwithstanding, you know, all the different uh, troubles that the EU has faced, right, it has always found a way, you know, all the criticisms, all the humiliation, all the, you know, the failed treaties and so on, right, all the problem child member states and so on, right, the EU has always been, you know, has always shown itself to be able to, you know, uh, over, you know, right, so not override, right over the crisis, right, and, you know, find some way out of, you know, the criticism and so on. Right, so no, I, I know it, this is slightly of a kinder, gentler, you know, softer take to the discussion. But what you do want to highlight is that when there's a crisis, subsequently, what does it, you know the the crisis is treated as a way to identify what are the existing loopholes, what are the existing problems, and then find a way to overcome it. 
right? Okay, so that is, you know, the angle when you discuss crisis or discuss the problems, okay? All right, so that is a, tech, uh, you know, a, 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 a analytical take that you can, you know, have, all right, okay? When you, um, you know, look at the challenges, right? So, you know, uh, you know, basically, EU has returned to the track of economic growth, right? Uh, you, know, exp you know, every time they have a, a, a reverse wave, right, they manage to bounce back, okay? All right. So that is, you know, one of the points that you want to highlight with the banking crisis. All right. Then you look at the annexation of Crimea by Russia uh, in March 2014. Right. It was basically a shock to the system. Why? Remember, what was it that the EU basically was about? They never wanted to return right, to that scenario where they engage in, you know, conflict with other states. Right. Uh, so, you know, this, this annexation by uh, Russia right, uh, was basically a shock to the system, all right, and they believed, you know, they were of the belief that they do not want to use military conflict to resolve, you know, any kind of disputes and so on, right, and it put security very high on the agenda. Uh, the EU and um, the EU and uh, Ukraine, right, uh, they have a, a, a joint meeting, right, I think uh, the most recent one was concluded in December, 20, November, December 2021, Right, uh, and they it's like a joint series of meetings. I think they've already had like nine meetings already, right? Uh, and and this you know, um, uh, is something I, I'll, I'll, that one's in the next slide, I'll mention that to you subsequently. This one here, right, in terms of the um, you know, the refugee crisis, right? You know, when they had the the annexation of Crimea, uh, EU basically you know, uh, implemented sanctions against Russia. Right, um, and you know they wanted to you know highlight that they this they're not going to allow this to be a dent on you know um, transatlantic or European unity, right? And then um, what happened is that you know uh, you know since 2015, right? Basically, the EU was struggling to cope with uh, the you know the refugee crisis. Uh, Wikipedia has got a good snapshot of this migrant crisis, you can take a look at that. I, I generally don't like to use Wikipedia to read, to, um, like, to, to actually uh, rely on. Uh, I use that as a snapshot to understand certain things because sometimes, you know, people tamper with Wikipedia entries and so on. But, you know, this one is a good snapshot to help you to understand this. Uh, and it was struggling to cope with, cope with the crisis, right? You had over 1 million people, uh, refugees, displaced people, migrants, asylum seekers, all, you know, entering into the EU. Either... Uh, you know, as a result of the, the crisis or, you know, they were basically in search of better, you know, economic uh, prospects and so on, right? Uh, and it placed a lot of burden on, you know, the various uh, transit, you know, countries, like, sorry, not counties, countries, uh, the R is missing, uh, like, you know, Turkey, Greece, Libya and so on. So what happened was uh, a new quota system was designed to relocate asylum seekers among the EU states, Slovakia rejected this quota system because it's basically EU, you know, basically telling states, okay, we will increase funding, we will pump millions into this project, right? But, you know, um, we tell you, you know, which are the different, uh, you know, states who will be taking in all of these different, you know, uh, uh, asylum seekers and so on, right? But remember, every time you talk about migrant crisis, you talk about asylum seekers, displaced peoples, so on, entering into these different states, right? What are you basically looking at? You're looking at these migrants or these asylum seekers be placing burdens, right, on the existing infrastructure of these different states, right? And remember... When you're looking at the EU, it's a conglomeration of, of all of these different states who are already at different levels of development, different levels of capacities, right? So the states, you know, basically, uh, individual countries, right, uh, basically, you know, had this issue where, where they... Okay, basically, you had different, uh, you know, individual countries, right, uh, who were unhappy with this imposition of this, uh, of this quota system. And they actually... Um, started to reintroduce border controls within the Schengen. And the Schengen is what? It's about free movement. Right? Uh, okay, so this is, you know, becomes problematic. So you've got rifts emerging among the different countries who say, we allow the migrants to come in. The other one says, we disallow the migrants to come in. How does this affect, you know, the supposed free movement of people, right, within, you know, the... the um, 
the different, uh, you know, uh, uh, states within the Schengen, right? Okay, so between 2015 and 2016, right, 1.2 million first-time asylum seekers basically, you know, were entering into the EU, right? Hungary, Sweden, Austria basically received the most number of applications, right? Okay, and, you know, uh, you know, in, in, in light of this, you know, uh, that was where EU decided to, you know, uh, implement uh, a major 10-point plan to tackle the crisis, okay? All right, uh, you know, uh, basically you find, you know, that states were very unhappy that, you know, their capacities were being overwhelmed, right? So that is, you know, basically the uh, argument down here, okay? All right. Uh, then this one, uh, I, I put it here. I, I know the, the timeline is jumping a little bit, but I wanted to theme it thematic. Uh, I wanted to group it thematically. That's why the timeline jumps a little bit, right? So that one was 2015, uh, 2016, right? Uh, you know, you had the migrant crisis and you had the part of the migrant crisis was a result of the asylum seekers. Uh, and then now you've got, you know, uh, you know, this threat by Russia. This one, please keep a lookout for it. This one very important for y'all. In particular, because we discussed NATO, right? And NATO has got a direct, uh, you know, impact on on, on this uh, Russian uh, tension, you know, created uh, by Russia, right? So um, this one you have to please, you know, keep watching, right? Okay. Uh, EU Ukraine, right? Basically, they've held their ninth round of discussion on the, you know, illegal annexation of Crimea, right? Uh, in uh, Sevastopol. Right and uh, subsequently, you know, to the annexation, you know, uh, this, this this meeting was the one that's telling you, uh, in November December twenty twenty one, right, and uh, they had uh, you had actually imposed restrictive measures, right, in response to you know the annexation of Crimea because it's a violation of international law, right, and uh, you know it continued to have diplomatic efforts, you know, uh, attempting to restore Ukraine sovereignty, right. EU uh, has already mentioned that they will not. Uh, it does not and will not recognize the, the illegal annexation of Crimea, right? And, uh, you know, it is committed to the policy. It's not packing down, similar to NATO as well, right? Okay. Uh, and when they met recently, right, uh, Ukraine and uh, EU both, you know, you know, uh, expressed uh, concern over the growing militarization uh, and, you know, the increasing number of troops that are on, you know, the peninsula by the Russian Federation, right? And how, you know, there's a deterioration of the um, of the human rights situation. Uh, over the last couple of days, uh, you know, in the run-up to the new year, right? Uh, I'll just mention this, uh, you know, in the run-up to the new year, uh, Russia actually put forth several security packs, Right, draft security packs to the to EU, to NATO, to the US, UK, right? Which uh, basically they have uh, articulated that they want to have an effective veto on Ukrainian membership to NATO, right? Which you know all the mem all the allies have basically said no, right? And uh, they also you know have uh, argued that. Um, NATO, you know, con you know, uh, continuously having drills and exercises, you know, near the Russian border is an unacceptable threat to Russian security. Like, look who's, you know, crying about this now. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, they put forward, you know, uh, certain demands. They basically said that uh, they do not want any of the, they do not want NATO to grant membership to any of the ex-Soviet states, right? So this is the development that has actually occurred so far, right? Uh, keep a lookout for it, okay? All right, I, I just wanted to mention it because I, I read it and I wanted to remind you. I will, um, I, I I have saved the article, right? I will upload it for you and label it as uh, under the NATO chapter, okay? All right, okay. This one, Poland, all right? Okay, let me explain this one to you. Uh, no, there is no polexit, right? Uh, but, you know, there was a, there was a, fear that they might actually, you know, have uh, been uh, a, a pull exit to uh, occur, right? So basically what, you know, the background of this entire problem, right, is, and I would say it's an unfolding drama. Please, you know, look out for the unfolding drama. So what happened, basically, is that uh, Polish, the, the Poles, basically uh, reformulated, you know, their law uh, that forced two out of five Supreme Court justices, forced out, two out of five of their Supreme Court justices, and attempted to give politicians more sway 
over, you know, um, making decisions that, you know, the court was basically supposed to, you know, uh, be in charge of, right? So, you know, um, any kind of decisions that are related to appointments to the Polish court, right? So this is basically, you know, the background to the problem, right? And then there are also um, a lot of electoral reforms that have occurred, right? So basically... Judicial independence in Poland has been severely hampered, severely affected, uh, affected, sorry, okay, affected. Uh, it is seen to basically violate uh, European law, right? Okay, Vi violate EU law. Uh, you know, the independence and impartiality of the Polish court has been severely compromised, right? And uh, Poland basically say that, you know, they are uh, unhappy with the way integration has been commencing. It's not that they do not want to be part of the EU anymore. It's not that they do not support integration, right? But they basically argue that, uh, you know, that the EU basically has been overbearing, right? Brussels has been overbearing and uh, they want to strengthen autonomy from EU institutions, right? And they want, you know, to have a scenario where the EU is not going to be able to impose any of their will on any of the weaker states, all right, okay. And, uh, you know, basically they have uh, also opposed the quota system for the refugees. So apart from Slovakia, now, you know, Poland is also, you know, quite unhappy about this. They have been departing from the EU over climate and energy policy, defense policy, and the migrants and so on, right? And they also vetoed the seven-year budget and COVID-19 stimulus package, which is kind of strange because they're actually looking to the EU for funding regarding the pandemic. Right. So that is, you know, um, uh, a problematic, but, you know, they're basically objecting to a conditionality cause uh, that, you know, basically says, I mean, which makes sense. If you're expecting funding, then, of course, you would have to adhere to a conditionality clause that says, you know, you've got to adhere to democratic standards and the rule of law. When we looked at conditionality and loans and funding, we criticized it when we talked about the IMF and World Bank. Why? Because those conditionalities basically emphasize that you need to engage in austerity measures, you need to sell off your private assets and, you know, hurt your own domestic economy in order to, you know, uh, you know put in place all of these neoliberal economic policies. This one is a different scenario altogether. I give you money, right? But the condition is that behave yourself, right? If you think about it, right? It's about adherence to democratic standards and rule of law. Like, that's a fundamental expectation of sovereign states, right? So that is, you know, slightly problematic. Then, you know, you look at this uh, argument down here in December 2021, right? This has come to, you know, uh, a head already, right? So EU has basically launched legal action against Poland for, you know, uh, basically, you know, uh, you know, ignoring, uh, you know, the bloc's law and so on, right? And, um uh, you know, uh, 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 EU, you know, has been withholding approval for the COVID-19 recovery uh, reforms, right? So basically what has happened is that the Polish Prime Minister, what's his name? Mateusz Morawiecki, all right, okay, I'll, I'll just write the like, Polish Prime Minister if you cannot remember the spelling, right, okay? Uh, if you cannot remember the spelling, please do not write some weird version of it, okay? Uh, Polish Prime Minister has argued that, you know, more and more, this, you know, uh, move by the EU on, and the European Commission shows a lack of understanding of the distinction between EU and national competencies. Basically, why they're arguing that the EU is disrespecting, right, the areas of the policy areas in which it has got authority over and in which national government has got authority over, right? And they refer to this as a trend for bureaucratic centralism, all right? Uh, and, you know, there must be a limit to the, you know, the competence that, you know, uh, the competencies or the competence areas, right, uh, that, you know, the EU should actually get involved in. So, you know, currently, you know, it's at a gridlock or an impasse, right? The only way out, uh, you know, that means the only way the EU is going to release funds for this COVID-19 recovery project to Poland is for Poland to actually back down and change its judicial laws, which it doesn't seem to be ready to do so at this point. Okay, all right? It's not willing to do so. The Polish government is not, uh, you know, willing 
to do so, right? Uh, you know, EU says, no, you have to change the judicial law. You have to provide for bigger independence for the court, right? System, e, uh, the EC, the European Commission is also very unhappy that the 2019, uh, you know, Polish law has basically prevented Polish courts from applying EU law in particular areas. And uh, Poland has basically said, we do not want to refer any legal questions to the European Court of Justice, meaning referring European referring legal questions to European European Court of Justice is basically asking the ECJ to interpret European law and to say whether it is or is not applicable in whatever scenarios. But Poland has implemented a law, domestic law, to say that we do not want to do this anymore. Right. So they're basically actually driven a wedge between themselves and EU, right? Okay, so this, you know, whole Poland drama, right, has been, you know, seen as breaching the general principles of autonomy, primacy, and effectiveness of the uniform application of European law. They've basically gone against the entire application of European law to Poland, right? So, um, you know, Poland, they're not going to be kicked out at this point, but they could be hit with a daily fine for non-compliance to the EU, right? So that's why I say it's an unfolding drama, okay? All right. Uh, so these are all the different uh, you know, articles. Please watch uh, this last one here, the DW News. This one gives you an entire summary. The last one, the last YouTube video, right? That one gives you an entire summary of all the things that's ha that has happened so far with Poland versus EU, okay? All right, all right. Then we move on to Hungary, okay? Okay, so with Hungary, right, uh, you know, Poland and Hungary have got a pact with each other, right? They say that they will shield each other uh, if the EU decides to take, you know, you know, conclusive action against, you know, either one of these states, right? Uh, and again, you know, Hungary is another one, uh, another problem child. You know, they want the funding, they want to receive, uh, you know, uh, funding from the EU, but basically, you know, they want to still undermine EU's principles, right? Uh, and, and, you know, this is very problematic, particularly in the case of Hungary, because Hungary under Orban now is, dis uh, is classified by Freedom House as being partly free, uh, and most states actually, you know, um, describe it as hybrid authoritarian or competitive uh, authoritarian system. So this is very problematic, right? Um, and I was reading the articles, you know, uh, you know, by or Hungary by Orban, right? And um, what he's basically said is that we do not want to leave the EU. We want to reform the EU instead, right? And and basically, why does he want to reform the EU? This one, you know, the irony of it all. Hungary under Orban is now considered to be dictated, uh, to be you know, uh, competitive, authoritarian, and so on, right? Orban himself has called Brussels dictatorial. Right. So, you know, the irony, that's why, you know, I mentioned you know, the irony of it all, right? You know, it's actually, you know, quite laughable in that sense, right? So when you look at Hungary, the other major problem is that um, uh, you need to, if you talk about this case, right, you need to discuss Orban, right? So Orban casting himself as defender of Hungary's cultural identity, uh, you know, against Muslim migration. Remember this is what I was telling you just now? Muslim migration into Europe, protector of Christian values against Western liberalism, uh, he has gotten a lot of support domestically from his core voters, right? But the rationale is that, you know, um, you know, uh, Hungary has said, you can't get rid of us, right? And, you know, but we want to keep our sovereignty. We want to, you know, we do not want to be in this so-called United States of Europe. That's basically what they're calling, you know, uh, EU right now, right? And EU leaders now are viewing, you know, Orban as a threat to, you know, EU values of, human rights of the rule of law, right? And it is quite unfortunate um, that EU has basically allowed Orban to, you know, grow uh, and build, build up his illiberal state with actually a lot of, you know, lavish EU funding. But remember just now I pointed out when there's a problem, then it serves as a catalyst to actually, you know, think about what are the shortcomings, right? So basically in a way, this entire problem has got a positive effect, right? Hungarian intransigence or Hungarian belligerence towards the EU, right, basically has prompted the EU to shift away from its very sluggish response, uh, you know, and now it is acting to safeguard its democratic principles, right? Brussels is now considering, right, how to, you know, rework its entire framework to now subject 
you know, its uh, membership to financial punishment as opposed to only political ones. Because by withholding, right, to Poland, the COVID-19 funding, right, basically that is, uh, but that's basically a financial sanction. It's a punishment, right? If you are not going to abide by the political and diplomatic rules, right, that the EU represents in terms of EU, uh, in terms of EU, EU values, human rights, democracy, and so on, then you're going to be subject to punishment. Prior to this, there was no such thing, you know, they had not wanted to link financial punishment or sanctions, right, to, you know, membership. But now, you know, they are basically thinking about, you know, how to, you know, uh, you know, make this connection. So that is actually, you know, worked in, in uh, you know, to uh, the advantage of, um, you know, the EU in this sense, okay? All right, Brexit. I kind of talked about this already, all right? So I'm not going to run through this slide because this is, a, you know, past information about, you know, how Brexit was badly handled by Juncker at that point and Merkel had to take over. So that one you can read, right? Uh, this one, the 2021 updates, right? Um, basically, what uh, you want to highlight is the cost. What, that's what I emphasized, uh, you know, to you earlier on. That's what you want to pay attention to. The costs. Uh, that, you know, is being experienced by Britain, you know, in terms of the aftermath of uh, Brexit, right? So, you know, UK is now free to, you know, uh, set its own trade policy, can negotiate its deals with others. Uh, so far, you know, when you looked at all of these different uh, deals, right, I think the Australian one was the only deal that they had actually concluded, uh, if I'm not wrong. The Australian, it was the Australian one. It was only one deal that they had concluded so far, right, okay? Uh, so, you know, basically uh, what you are looking at is that um, the cost of the exit is becoming clearer. It's a drag on UK growth. Voters are increasingly very unhappy, right, in UK. Uh, you know, they are basically now experiencing uh, exacerbation of supply chain uh, shortages, increased inflation. Trade is being severely hampered, right? Be Brexit was basically championed as, you know, being taken... Uh, you know, as, as Britain taking charge of Britain's own, you know, destiny. But if you look at the polls currently, there was a poll conducted recently, right? Uh, basically, majority of population now are regretting their decision in, you know, uh, in 2016. And they actually were thinking of, you know, uh, you know, how it would be like to rejoin the EU. So, you know, you've got the impact on trade. Right, uh, you know, uh, new customs, paperwork, checks and uh, checks, right? Uh, when they looked at the trade over the last year, I think in the whole of 2021, I think there was about 15.7% lower trade, uh, you know, uh, that then when Britain was actually part of the EU. That means they've actually, you know, have a deficit in trade. So, you know, basically, and this itself is actually a flattering figure because. Britain had consistently delayed all of these customs regulations and so on, and only have actually kicked in as of January 2022. So that means the logic is this. Moving forward for the rest of the year and subsequently, you're going to see even further impacts, right, on, you know, trade, growth, finance, and labor. I've uploaded for you in the Google Drive, right, uh, a Bloomberg, Bloomberg article um, that is on uh, explaining the, the negative effects of uh, the new customs uh, and the new regulations, right, on Britain. Uh, it is a written article, I think it's from December 2021. Right, take a look at that one, okay? All right. <clears throat> okay, so these are different, uh, you know, articles. I've got, you know, some of the newer ones for you. Uh, I've uploaded two articles for you into eGlobal. All right, take a look at that. All right, okay, remember Euroscepticism? We talked about it just now, all right? Uh, basically, you know, Brexit, uh, job, you know, the, the Brexit, whatever risk to, you know, sovereignty, the economic crisis, and all of these different things, right? Basically, you know, precipitated, uh, you know, Euroscepticism. So what you want to highlight, if you talk about Euroscepticism, please have a definition. Skeptical or negative attitudes towards the process of, you know, European integration or towards the EU. Basically, when you look at Euroscepticism, right, uh, you would think of it, you know, in terms of two ways, right? Scholars, you know, basically distinguish between hard and soft varieties, right? So mainly, mainly meaning, you know, whether, you know, how opposed to the EU, you know, are they, right? So um, I would say maybe like, for example, Brexit, Hungary and Poland, right, would be more of a hard Eurosceptic uh, approach, right? Because it's more of a principled opposition to the EU, 
as opposed to soft your skepticism, right? Uh, you know, with basically you're looking at specific issue areas or specific competencies where there's some unhappiness uh, expressed by <clears throat> you know certain states and so on, right? Uh, you know, where it's not a case where they are basically presenting themselves as you know direct challenges to uh, EU authority. Okay. All right, so uh, that is how I would look at it, right? The hard skepticism is closer to what, you know, um, Hungary and Poland uh, and, and Brexit basically represented, okay? All right, so I would uh, be of the opinion, right, at this point, all right, not to jump into conclusions, and I would highly recommend that, you know, you do the same also, not to quick jump into conclusions and say, oh, you know, there are going to be several other exits, like I had, what I highlighted to you, uh, you know, uh, earlier on, right? Rather than to think of, you know, a pull exit or a hung exit, right, which is what they labeled it, uh, you know, I would think that, you know, maybe it would be more like, a, you know, a weakening of the EU instead. And as usual, right, as a result of the weakening, uh, the EU will find a way to, you know, perhaps uh, include another treaty, provide some concessions, you know, explain to states again, you know, what are the benefits of, you know, being part of the EU are and so on. All right. So, you know, you may have a gradual weakening before, you know, you have an upswing all over again. But, you know, what is very telling, which is that point that I do want to highlight this one, right? The troubles that Britain basically endured in Brexit negotiations, right, is very, uh, you know, it is hard evidence to rest of the states, right, uh, that, you know, it may not be the best idea and may not be a very easy process to withdraw from the EU altogether, right? And, uh, you know, it may not strengthen desire for these Eurosceptics to actually push for, you know, an exit from the EU, right? Uh, so it may not necessarily, you know, allow populist or Eurosceptic sentiments to override the EU because, you know, basically the EU citizens, you know, have been witness, right, to all of these processes, right? So, you know, um, there is no real you know, alternative to the EU either, right? To say that, you know, I, I rather, you know, be part of another organization. I rather, you know, I, I would see myself as potentially being better off if I was not part of the EU, right? Despite whatever challenges that it may seem to present, notice my language, right? Whatever challenges that it may seem to present to sovereignty, uh, there doesn't seem to be any other real proper alternative, right, to the EU per se, right? So what, instead of, you know, Brexit per se, uh, you know, oh, sorry, instead of exit, uh, like Brexit per se, you may witness other kinds of opposition or other kinds of exits, right? So you may have, you know, um, say like, for example, during the migrant crisis where you had some states who say, you know, I want to reintroduce border controls because this is a negative impact. So you may, you may have, you know, states starting to think about, you know, in particular competences, particular areas, right, where may I, you know, attempt to uh, roll back EU legislation, right, and, you know, uh, you know, uh, make an argument or make a, you know, demand to basically, you know, uh, not comply Right or you know uh, make amendments to you know ex you know existing legislation and so on right so they these may be some of the examples this notice all the language down here right there may be a scenario where they do not want to comply right uh, you know there may be a desire to pay less money right it's not to say that this is what is going to happen so please be careful with the language that you're using as well okay. All right. Uh, and also what you may want to think about, right, is that, you know, it may it may sort of weaken and undermine, you know, the decision making processes uh, and so on. But like I said, you know, this gradual weakening or this gradual process will also provide you with the time, with the impetus, the catalyst, right? to start thinking about how to address these problems. It's not to say that, you know, the EU is not paying attention to any of these issues, right? Okay, so I've got a couple of these videos for you to take a look at. All right, this is the one that I was talking about, right? So this is uh, what you can use in a conclusion, number one. Number two, right, if you get a question that asks you from the get-go, how do you think the EU should reform itself, right? This could be part of your thesis statement. That means you could be you know, presenting these, uh, you know, uh, how should it reform itself? You could think about approaching, right, uh, you know, uh, integration in these three different ways, right? And then you explain it, right? And then your rest of the essay, right, will the, the 
first part of the essay would be to say, why did it, is it that we came to a conclusion where the EU needs to reform itself? Right? And then the rest of the essay can go on to explain which are the, how are these different ways right, where the EU can actually think about you know, uh, reforming itself in, in these different ways. So that's why I say this one can be like part of a thesis statement. So question is, how should it reform itself? TC statement is that these are the different ways, right? This statement is multi-speed Europe, multi-tier or multi-layer Europe, Europe a la carte, and so on, right? Then your first part of the argument would be to say the EU needs to reform itself because you have all of these existing problems. You have, uh, you know, Hungary and Poland have made these kind of charges. You have states who feel that, you know, Brussels has been overbearing. You have got enlargement and the problems associated with enlargement. You've got the threat from Russia and so on. Then you go on to, again, expand on these issues, right? You can start talking about, you know, how uh, the EU is basically an intergovernmental organisation, how decisions are basically made in a consensus building style and how the consensus building uh, you know, approach that the EU already has in place will complement these recommendations. You understand how to structure an answer? Are, are we, everybody following me? Understand? Okay. All right. So this is how you could use it. You could use it in a conclusion like how I've done down here as well. So I'm just showing you different ways to use the information, right? You can use it as a conclusion, like what I've done down here, right? Uh, Multi-speed Europe, right? All members pursue same objectives, but some achieve them later than others because of economic weakness. Because remember, we talked about the varied capacities, right? So, you know, um, this is an eventual goal. Take your time, right? Implement it how you want to implement it. Take your time and so on. Multi-tier or multi-layer, right? So you've got, you know, uh, members with, different levels of commitment to EU, basically, because you've got a hard core of member states, right, you know, on a fast track that are basically, you know, agreeable, they are on board, they have the capacity to, you know, uh, have, you know, uh, accommodate all of these binding regulations and so on. And then you've got a softer core, right, where they have got limited agendas and they basically use the EU for to you know extract particular gains, right? Uh, you know, like say for example, they require endorsement or they're following particular aspects of monetary policy and so on. And then the last one, I like the last one actually. Uh, it's a Europe a la carte or a Europe of opt out. It's like an a la carte menu. I choose what I want, right? I'm I'm a, I'm a member, right? But I you know instead of you know arguing and saying I do not want this entire package, right? Uh, that's logic lah. Package versus a la carte. Right? So I choose what I want. I have my own agenda. I participate only in policy areas or in policies you know, in which I want to take part. So I think that you know, is a very good way uh, you know, to look at you know, the entire argument. Last slide right, about moving forward also. Uh, you know, I would like you to you know, take a look at you know, a couple of these different videos. And please read the last one, the Eurobarometer, the one I was explaining to you just now. Okay. What happens is that, uh, like I said, you know, uh, it, the optimism for European future is the highest since 2009, which is actually quite surprising given that the last two years, right, uh, have been, you know, have, all of us have been actually, you know, you know uh, beaten down, you know, uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic. And yet optimism in the EU is actually at the highest, right? So support for Euro, the Euro is actually very stable among uh, those who participated in the Eurobarometer. Uh, there was improvement in the perception of the improvement of the national economies, right? So that means people basically have got confidence in the national economies. Majority of Europeans were actually deemed to be satisfied by all of the measures taken by the by the EU with regards to handling the COVID-19 pandemic, right? And about two-thirds of Europeans basically trust the EU to make the right decisions about, you know, pandemic recovery, post-pandemic recovery. I don't know, can we use the word post-pandemic? Because I think we're still in the middle of this crap. Okay, uh, but, you know, uh, in, in, in you know, pandemic recovery, right? So basically, that's what it is. You know, it's a very glowing review, which is quite surprising, uh, you know, given, you know, the, the issues that, you know, uh, you know, most states have faced, right? Okay? All right. Uh, I just decided to give to you the question. I'm not going to talk to you and ask you to think about it uh, first, right? So I've just, you know, one shot given you the answer outline, right? What is so attractive? About, sorry, sorry, sorry. What is so attractive about the EU that so many states have sought to join it? This question has come out many times for exam. 
pray that this question comes out for your exam as well this year because you know it's a tried and tested uh you know a uh, uh, question right there will you know it's it's really a, a very uh good question to answer because basically what you need to do is just define attractive what is the meaning of attractive what is it that draws states to want to be part of the eu despite right criticisms or charges of you know having to give up sovereignty, so-called give up sovereignty, right? You know, how it's an intergovernmentalist organization, how, you know, moving forward, EU could take any one of these approaches, right? You know, you could still use this, right, to answer that question to say that, you know, moving forward, if EU actually, you know, evolves, right, to, um, you know, creating all of these different alternatives, right, then it would make the EU even more attractive to states, correct? Can you see how to manipulate can you see how easy it is to manipulate? Once you once you understand what each of these you know concepts actually refer to, right? You can basically manipulate it and fit it into any question. What I want to emphasize before I finish off, right, today is to highlight. Remember, please do not write an exam answer that is generic, that is just a regurgitation of random points about whatever organization, like EU or whatever, right? To a point where I can cut your answer and paste a different question and your answer will still fit. Right? That means you have not answered the question. Right? I will leave you with this thought for today. Right? I think I've nagged enough at, uh, you know, at y'all regarding you know, the writing of exam questions. Right? Uh, but you need to start thinking about all of this. Okay? I will see you all next week. We do Organization of African Unity. I know it's not a topic that a lot of students actually enjoy. But uh, you know, I will provide you with a background on Africa. I will provide you with a background on regionalization, which you may be able to use for EU as well, right? And I will recommend that you do come for lecture and do pay attention to that topic because uh, if it so happens that in some years of exam, they have actually combined, uh, you know, uh, African uh, Union with the European Union, right? Uh, ask you a you know, joint question or they ask you a question about regionalization, Right, uh, write your answer in application to any region of your choice. And basically, you would have to refer to either Africa or you would have to refer to Europe, right? So I would still think, I know a lot of people, and people have told me that to my face, you know, we don't really enjoy the Africa topic. Uh, but I'm sorry, it was part of the syllabus, right? But I would still think it's useful, okay? All right, I'll see you all next week. Bye-bye. Sorry, I overshot three minutes today, all right? But last week, I finished on time. <laughs> or the week before, sorry, last, not last week. All right, see you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, bye. Bye, everyone.